SMMEs, their brands, because it becomes a challenge. Most of them have been listed with a number of retailers, but they are not getting the traction that you want them to get. People still go for these big brands that they know about. So it's important for us to partner with institutions like probably South Africa, uh, so that they can educate the public, but also encourage them to support and buy from small businesses. We also have an initiative driven through small enterprise development agents, which is a pop-up market, where we expose uh, our SMMEs, uh, the goods that they produce, uh, and we set up these pop-up markets in malls because there is high uh, food traffic in those areas. Responses that we get from private sector organizations that SMMEs produce and supply products or render services that saturate the market. I think we've seen that uh, with uh, is the personal care sector in particular, there's quite a lot of SMEs who are involved in that space. So it's important for us to also spread uh, the sectors where these SMEs are involved in so that uh, they can take up opportunities in other uh, subsectors. You know, linked to product saturation, another problem relates to the lack of available shelf space. And to address these challenges, we're also working closely with some uh, retailers, uh, the emerging ones, uh, we work closely with Zulzi, for example, I'm sure some of you know about Zulzi, uh, Mint Marketplace and other e-commerce platform, including exposure to international markets. We'll also receive a feedback that SMS products and services are not affordable or priced above the market rate. We know that some of them are a little bit desperate because of the cost of production. That's why they end up pricing their products a little bit up higher. So this is not an easy one uh, to resolve. Uh, in some cases, SMEs are also competing with large enterprises who have uh, bigger resources. They are able to buy in bulk. So it becomes a challenge for them you know, to be competitive, uh, these SMEs. So we do need a collaborative effort to work together in assisting SMEs to enhance their competitiveness and achieve economies of scale. One instrument that we'll be launching soon as a department where we're working with the EU is the clustering methodology to assist small businesses in a similar industry to collaborate and get linked uh, to lead firm. Other challenges are related to perceptions of poor quality packaging, inconsistency in delivering the goods and capacity issues. That's why we have this intervention, which is still under-resourced uh, under the Small Enterprise Development Agency where we assist uh, with issues of uh, product testing, barcoding, packaging, labeling, and all these other certifications uh, requirements. So it's important for us as government as well to invest more in this uh, area. More partners are required as a, the backlog of small enterprises that require these services is huge. This is where the ESD funds we believe can play a critical role in complementing uh, government efforts. Other challenges we face include SMEs that assume that the area of market leakages is quick, and expect to be listed immediately after being introduced to the market. MZ has been receiving quite a lot of uh, backlash. Uh, I do forward all these messages to him uh, to resolve because some of the SMEs they say, but I've been talking, uh, you introduced me to this particular retailer. We've been talking for a year now. We're not getting anywhere. Uh, but I think we also try and make sure that they understand that they, they also have to protect you know their brands as these retailers they mean to make sure that they have goods that are of good quality they're also safe for consumption so it's important that we make them understand the journey we don't we're not excusing them for taking too long to respond but we are saying there is a journey that needs to be undertaken for these uh, smmes uh, to also supply and assist us because as a country we do need competitive smmes in most developed developed countries uh, jobs and economic growth is driven by small businesses. So our intervention and investment uh, together with the private sector in the sector is very critical. It's critical for us as government, but also critical as for the society as a whole. So we are here attending this policy dialogue to determine how best we can all support SMMEs to play an important role in addressing the three uh, challenges that we are facing in the country, poverty, unemployment, and inequality. We look forward to a very fruitful engagement between government and business and believe that indeed working together will assist to have these critical SMMEs and cooperatives that will assist us to address uh, these challenges we face as a country. Uh, we, are, we look forward to your engagement. I think the program director has already requested that please don't hold back to assist us in providing solutions so that we can see or go back from our side as government uh, to look at all these interventions that we must introduce. I must indicate that uh, with the Triple B Commission, we do have a very positive uh, relationship where we are engaging there in agreement that ESD indeed 
can be a critical lever. Maybe we must also shift the focus a little bit away from ownership, but look at this ESD space. And I believe the commissioner will be here tomorrow to also share his views. We are in the, on, of the same mind. We're also engaging with the DTIC because the policy sits with the DTIC. So they are the ones who must also make some decisions when it comes to is ESD, how we can improve it. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Program Director. Thank you. You know, your, your vertical challenges are not my problem, TG. <laughs> Thank you so much for those opening words. It's, it's great to see and hear the amount of action that's happening um, in government, in the department, in support of, of the work we are all trying to achieve, and that is how do we support our small businesses. Moving on with our program, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now introduce you to the CEO of EmpowerDex. Um, Empowerdex, as you know, are one of the top rating agencies, BE verification agencies in the country. They also provide advisory services when it comes to BE. And uh, Lerato Ratsoma is the CEO there. She's been the CEO for a couple of years now. And um, she's recorded a presentation for us. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us in person, but she did record a presentation for us that focuses on the ESD element of the Sunlam Gauge research. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, um, the Sunlam Transformation Gauge, which is in partnership with the Sunday Times, is now in its third year, and it's the only consolidated sector-focused research report that takes a holistic measurement of economic transformation in South Africa, accounting for all elements of broad-based Black economic empowerment. It's been a pleasure and an honor for me to lead this, pro this particular project, and the research is done by IntelliDex to make sure that it remains independent. And then the analysis of the data is done by EmpowerDex, which is led by Lerato. In a few months' time, we will be launching, a few weeks' time, in fact, we'll be launching the 2023 version of it. I'll ensure that we extend the invite to all of you in the audience. And just give you a sense what the research does. It takes a sample of scorecards from companies that are uploading their scorecards on various um, databases. So there's a couple of databases in South Africa that receive scorecards from all sorts of companies. For listed companies, it's obviously easier. Uh, for SOEs, it's also relatively easier. But for the hundreds of thousands of companies out there, they may not be. So we started the research, I think the first year, we had like 3,500 scorecards. And uh, we've now consistently been able to have a population or sample size of over 10,000 companies. And that includes all the big guns in all the industries. So the research has now become a lot more um, uh, stable. It's become a lot more um, um, usable from in, in terms of taking that data based on the size of the sample size and extrapolated on the, on, the, on, the, on the population. So what the research does is it focuses on the sectors. So there'll be 10,000 samples, but all of those scorecards are obviously reporting in terms of either generic or in terms of a particular sector code. And all the ones that report into a sector code are put into those sector codes. And then we're able to get data about each sector code. So you can imagine all nine or 10 different sector codes, um, all five elements plus the digital ones that happen in various sector codes are then reported on. So ESD as a standalone is analyzed by ESD in each and every single one of these sectors and also ESD in totality of all the companies that form um, the population. So Lerato uh, recorded or pre-recorded for us a presentation on the 2022 research, which is the, the, the current research before we launched the 2023 version, and what came out of that research insofar as ESD is concerned. So please put your hands together for Ms. Lerato Ratsoma. Good day, everyone. My name is Lerato Ratsoma from EmpowerDex. Um, I have been asked today to do a presentation of the 2022 Sunlam Gauge this was uh, issued last year, around about July, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It is research that was done by IntelliDex and published in July 2022 with the intention of assessing how far South Africa is in terms of transformation. So the first one was done in 2021, and that was basically to form a baseline in terms of how transformation has, has progressed over the years. And the intention is to come up with a research on an annual basis, looking at all the companies that have been verified in the market or as many as we can get to 
and being able to then assess how far they are, whether we are improving, uh, whether we are going backwards, regressing, or uh, and whether we are on the right track, you know. So when we look at the, as you all know, we have the generic scorecard, which majority of the companies are assessed on. And then we have sector codes that are slightly different to the um, uh, generic codes. So in this case, we looked at all of the generic um, companies that we could find, as well as the different sector codes to be able to determine on average, what is the average scores? How, what is the average across all of the elements of their particular uh, scorecards to be able to then come up with a position of how far we are with empowerment. Now, coming up with the question of how far we are with empowerment, the idea is to look at that and see, is this where we want to go? Are there things that we should be uh, increasing or decreasing? And is it leading to the ultimate goal? Uh, will it get us to a transformed economy that the E is trying to get at? So as you can see from this page, um, we've assessed about 10,000 scorecards to come up with uh, the BEE recognition levels. Right at the bottom, we've got the generic scorecards, which uh, came up with the majority of the scores. And we found that on average, the scoring is around level four. Um, as you know, we go from level one until level eight, and then below level eight is non-compliant. So generics would have been around um, 87 uh, points on average, and that would give us the level four. Then we also looked at all of the scorecards that came under the different um, uh, sector codes. Uh, we've got the Agri-BE lending at around the level three, so as uh, construction, financial services lended at around level four. In fact, it was financial services, forestry, ICT, integrated uh, transport, the uh, marketing and uh, advertising council as well, as well as the uh, property and tourism that came up at level four. As you can see, these ones would be ranging from 87 all the way down to 84, which is still within the level four uh, contribution level. Now, I must then mention that uh, we've included integrated transport as part of the assessment because obviously those companies would also have been rated. However, uh, they are rated on a slightly different scorecard. Theirs is out of um, seven elements, whereas everybody else on average is out of five uh, elements. Uh, Integrated the transport is still using the basis of the 2007 BE scorecard, uh, as opposed to the 2013 that all of the other sector codes have been amended to. However, we do know that integrated transport, um, uh, they have, the, the sector council has stated that they are um, a uh, scorecard or their amended scorecard should be out at least in draft form in 2023. Uh, hopefully to be implemented still in 2023 or next year, uh, which means that next year, when we look at this, or maybe not next year, because I'm sure it will take about a year for the companies to be adjusted, but going forward, they will also be aligned with everybody else. Okay. Now, um, I think because we are looking at enterprise development, it would be good to then mention what it is that we'll be looking at under enterprise development. Um, the, it consists of procurement, which is out of 27 points, supply development and uh, out of 10 points and enterprise development out of five points. The idea is that we would have all the companies, the black owned EMEs and QSEs that could potentially be part of the supply chain of a company coming through as enterprise development. Uh, at this point, the company would assist them in the development and establishment financial sustainability uh, to get them to uh, be at a stable position. And then once they are able to uh, um, supply, they then move over to supply development still with a bit of support from the company. This is out of 10 points and I think on average 2% of the net profit after tax. And once you have them under supply development, they start affecting your pro procurement scorecard. As you know, the generic scorecard is looking at around 50% of the scorecard being from 51% black owned companies and also from EMEs and QSEs and 30% black women owned companies. So 
the idea is that all, all the <clears throat> enterprises that get developed that go into supply development ultimately will lead to procurement being improved and having a much more transformed, diversified um, supply chain in all of the companies. So that is the, the point of all of this. I must, I must just remind you that the different sectors would have slightly different pointing point systems um, because of whatever focus the particular um, uh, sector coach would have been looking at, but on average, most of them would have something to this effect for all of their um, the scorecards. Now, going into the meat of, the, of this whole Sunlam Gage report. What we found is that when you combine all of those, the generics, the financial services, all of the companies, we found that on average, the companies were scoring around a level four. And if you were to say, okay, how were they scoring out of a level four? We have then looked at all of the elements that get assessed to determine how far they are from the target. So the target here being 100%, uh, we were able to determine that from a BE ownership point of view, most of the companies were coming out at around 75% uh, in ownership. As you remember, as you may know, ownership is not just ownership uh, or, or shareholding. It can also come in the forms of a sale of assets, continuing consequences, as well as equity equivalents for the multinationals. And that is what we came up with uh, in terms of ownership. We we're sitting at 74%. And also recalling that the target for ownership is actually 25% black ownership. Um, so that gives you an idea of how far we are from reaching the full 25 points and 25% uh, uh, from an ownership point of view. Now, one of the things that we have um, discussed as a whole is um, whether the ownership targets are sufficient, the 25%. And if we are at 75% of that 25%, what needs to be done to get us to 100%? And if it was to be increased to say 30% or even 40%, how would we look as a whole? So this is some one of the things that um, I think as a nation we would need to look at and de determine where it is that we're trying to get with ownership. Now, management and control is looking at the people that are hired by a company. Um, it's looking at, at the different management levels, whether it is uh, senior management, junior management, as well as the board of the company. So on average, we were at 55.9, so just over um, halfway to attaining our full points, which is also something that should be considered, considering that the average men on the street, when they think about transformation, they want to see transformation, and this is where we look at transformation. So if majority of the companies are sitting at 55% of the, of the achievement of the scores, um, perhaps it is one of the areas that we would need to look at. As some of you may be aware, there have been some amendments in the Employment Equity Act, which obviously would uh, influence uh, BE, and we're hoping that some of those amendments may lead to a better or more concerted effort from companies to try and move this up to at least to the 70s or even um, the 80s. Then we've got skills development, which is um, the, the level to which companies are training their employees and uh, getting them ready for the different higher management levels. And here we're again looking at around 74.4, about 75% of the way there. Um, if you can um, think about it, on average, 6% of the payroll is expected to go to training Black people, um, whether it is uh, through bursaries or through actual direct training. Um, it's got elements of learnerships or internships where we're looking at uh, people who are starting out, uh, just finished their education, coming in to the workforce and being trained and if possible also being absorbed at the end of the learnership program. So this is where we're sitting. Then we go to the roots of why we're all here, enterprise and supply development. As you can see, we're sitting at 64.5% of the target. So 64.5% of that 42 that I showed you or whatever the target would be for any particular sector. Now, this is quite concerning because if you consider that 
procurement is basically what makes the world go round. Well, not really, but in other words, whatever a company is procuring, it is it it has an impact on the economy. Procurement is what has made sure that BE stays relevant for as long as it has, because me as a company requiring my suppliers to be transformed, that is what has led to even companies that have nothing to do with government being transformed as they have been over the years. However, if we're sitting now in 2022, in this case, not 23, because these are last year's figures, and we're sitting at 65% uh, on average attainment of the ESD element, for me, it tells us that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done under enterprise development. And because I'm from the verification space, we do know that the majority of companies can get full points under enterprise development or under supplier development, but they don't always get the full points under procurement, which is the core of it, because well, there is no point in doing enterprise development or supplier development if it does not translate into those companies coming into the value chain or into the supply chain and actually being procured from. That's the only way that they will grow. That's the only way that they can have an impact on the economy. So yes, um, having a community of practice around uh, ESD, uh, looking at how to make sure that ESD is effect, uh, impactful and it actually has a positive effect on those black owned entities who are the beneficiaries and that those companies, those uh, small entities are able to translate into proper long term suppliers. That is what we're trying to get at. So, yes, that's how we're looking in terms of enterprise development. Now, socioeconomic development is uh, obviously out of the chart because the majority of companies are doing this and also because some of the sector codes have much higher um, targets, which then skews us um, completely above the 100%. Uh, but socioeconomic development, getting black people into the mainstream of the economy, ensuring that they are able to contribute economically and be sustained, whether it's through education, health, um, uh, entrepreneurship training uh, at schools or at universities or people who are looking to go to become entrepreneurs, all of those types of things, rural development, um, infrastructure development in some instances as well, in rural areas in particular, all of those would count under socioeconomic development. So at the end of the day, um, we're looking at contribution levels that are uh, highly influenced by what the companies are concentrating on um, with ownership and skills development at around 75% attainment and enterprise development at 65, uh, management at 55 or 56 in this case, and obviously exceeding the targets in terms of the socioeconomic development. So out of 100%, we're looking at the 71% attainment of those targets, which um, equates to a level four. Now, level four is what, um, if you were to look at the recognition levels, it means that every one rent you spend with a level four company, you get one, one you get to recognize 100% of that. The aim is always to reach for level one. Most companies are aiming for level one, which uh, is the 135%. So ourselves as a nation, as South Africa Inc., we're looking at um, only level four at the moment. And that's something that we need to discuss. How do we go over? How, what needs to happen for majority of the companies to actually take it one, one step further? what needs to be moved, what needs to be shifted, what kind of uh, mindset do we need to have in order to push things uh, forward. And in my opinion, the work that needs to happen is here, um, looking at impactful initiatives that can actually improve procurement. Now, it would, uh, we, when we did the Sunlam Gage, it was um, uh, quite one of the things that we wanted to do was to look at how state-owned ent entities are doing, because they are also major um, employers and they have quite a lot of influence in terms of BEE. And so they get assessed like everybody else, except for on ownership. And what we saw is that, uh, interestingly enough, Management and control under state-owned entities is much higher, looking at 71% attainment as opposed to 55 uh, with the rest of the, the other scorecards. 
skills development is on par, around 74, 75%. And the one that uh, was most surprising is that uh, enterprise and supply development is sitting at 97%. So they are almost at 100% attainment. I think um, for, for, for myself, apologies for that. It is quite, it, this is something that we can look into to assess what are they doing that is different, that is able to push enterprise and supply development and obviously also procurement into such a higher state. How, did, how are they able to be at 97% attainment when everybody else is sitting in the 60s? So this is one of the things that, uh, which is why we had to look at state entities. What can we learn from them? What are they doing that is different? And can, can it be translated into other industries? Then the next part of the, the, the assessment was to look at the listed versus unlisted companies. Now, the assumption here is that listed companies have much more of a spotlight, especially because they also have to uh, publish uh, sense uh, announcements when they have issued their BE compliance reports, and they need to send those compliance reports to the BE commissioner. So we therefore are expecting that they would have more resources to look into BE and man maintaining their scores and making sure that they are higher than the average. That is the assumption. But now looking at the actuals, um, the blue would be the listed and the greenish, um, not good with colors, um, would be the unlisted companies. So we can see here that they are on par, around 76 versus 75% when it comes to ownership. And when it comes to uh, management and control, they're sitting at 50, 53% versus 59% um, for the unlisted, which means that they are probably the group that uh, brought down the average. Um, this is quite surprising because we expect that the boards of listed companies would be um, uh, quite transformed by now. We're expecting that even their hiring practices, considering that their ratings need to go to the BE commissioner for assessments that there would be um, above par. But yes, this is where we're looking at at 53% versus 59 for the understated companies. Then looking at um, skills development, they're sitting at 67%, even lower um, than the understated companies. And looking at enterprise and supply development, surprisingly, they are the ones who are pushing up the average, sitting at 80%. Um, this is something that should be commended considering that um, uh, there is a lot of uh, focus on enterprise and supply development uh, across the board, but if they're able to, to do it in such a way that it actually influences procurement, then it's something that is commendable and also not a bad idea to look into them for some best practices in terms of how they implement enterprise development and supply development on their side. And of course, socioeconomic development, uh, everyone's doing well in that particular area. Now, when we go into the ESD achievements for the different sectors, so we thought um, it would be uh, interesting to look at how far the different sectors are from their own goals. Now, with ESD, the, the unfortunate part is that this, the certificates that we would assess, they do not show us how the companies would have performed under um, procurement versus enterprise development versus supply development, but we get a, a whole figure that we're dealing with. But as much as it is not ideal, we're still able to, uh, to gauge what is happening within the different sectors. For example, we've got AgriBE that is on average sitting on uh, 24 points out of 40 uh, of their scorecard meaning that there is there, there there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in that industry when it comes to enterprise development and uh, supply development construction is sitting at 20 out of 34 on average which means that um, they also have in fact if you look across majority of the industries are, are far from achieving their their scores but it's now a matter of looking at just how far is the gap so 20 versus 34 uh, uh, is the gap in construction, financial services, and sitting at 24 versus 35. Um, 
which at least is slightly better um, than the construction guys. Uh, then when we look at forestry, they're sitting at 29, whereas their target is sitting at 43. ICT has the highest target, which is 50, or the highest weightings, not target um, weightings, which is 50. And on average, they're sitting at around 30, 30 points, 30.9 30 points. Um, so a whole 20 that, uh, points that could still be gained, which means that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in this particular one. Uh, integrated transport. Um, this one is uh, mainly looking at enterprise development and, and procurement. Remember, there was no supply development there. So they're sitting on an average of 20 points out of 35. Um, and then under the marketing, advertising and communications um, uh, sector code, we're looking at 20 points out of 42. Uh, properties at 24 points out of 39. Uh, tourism is at 26 out of 40 and uh, the generics are at 32 out of 42. For me, this tells us that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done under ESD. Uh, there is still major gaps. Um, if you look at uh, the likes of the ICTs and things like that, there's still major gaps that need to be filled. And we, the idea is that the community of practice will come up with those best practices that should be applicable in a variety of industries to enable them to at least inch closer to their own individual uh, weightings or targets uh, on their own scorecards. And like I said before, the improvement in enterprise uh, development and supply development should translate into better procurement scores. So procurement is just a reflection of how good your initi initiatives are at the end of the day. We also looked at a uh, 10 year history, um, going back to 2011 to see um, how uh, BE has progressed. Also taking into account that there was a change in scorecards round about, uh, well, round about 2015, 16, um, mainly because the, the changes that were implemented in 2013 were only effective in 2015. Um, so a lot of the scorecards would then would, would have started uh, being impacted round about those two years, 15 and 16. So looking at the progress, um, we can see that over time, ownership has slightly increased, uh, the red one, uh, over time, uh, which is a good thing uh, because now we are closer to achieving our goals of still 25%. There hasn't been, there wasn't a major change in how ownership is calculated um, when you look at the 2007 versus 2013 codes. And then looking at skills development, there's been an improvement in the scoring with a slight dip probably due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, looking at this one, uh, the blue is the management and control also increasing over time. Now, the ESD one is this one that starts around about 2016. That's mainly because there was no ESD uh, prior to that. But if we look at ESD, which is this, uh, the, the orange one, we can see it going upwards and then almost plateauing over time. So the question is, what needs to happen to get it to be on an upward trajectory again going forward? I'm not going to mention ESD because that's always above 100% in any case. Now, that is basically what we could assess from a Sunlam gauge point of view. The 2023 20, uh, Sunlam gauge will be published in July, around about July 2023. And we are hoping that there could have been some increases or some improvements in the scores that uh, we have looked at uh, today. When you consider those scores, especially from ESD point of view, um, there is still a lot that needs to be done. There is still a, a big gaps across the different sector codes in terms of what needs to be done. I have, when we do the assessments, what we have noted is that um, there's uncoordinated activities within industries, uh, which means that there isn't really much impact across an industry, even if it may be uh, beneficial to one entity within that industry. So what would help in my mind is that 
uh, more coordinated uh, initiatives that that can pool um, uh, resources so that we can get better impact. Um, one of the things that we've noted is that a lot of companies also offer programs um, that are not necessary, that are quite generic and not specific to the needs of those companies. Um, it is a requirement to do gap analysis or needs analysis in some industries. However, the majority of the programs that we see are quite generic. And um, if you are a small black owned uh, entity, regardless of what it is that you're offering, you will still be required to do something like basics of um, finance and things like that, whether or not you need it or, or not, or be offered office space whether or not you need office space uh, you know so those are some of the issues that we're facing and the idea is to look at those entities on an individual basis and determining what the gaps are and being able to plug them so that they can be more uh, impactful not just so that you can get the points from an uh, enterprise development and supply development uh, uh, point of view Another issue that keeps coming up is the beneficiaries being recycled in different programs um, uh, and not necessarily being included in the procurement of the company. Uh, a lot of the beneficiaries would, would, would um, complain that they get put through so many different programs and still don't get the types of procurement flows that they are looking for in order to grow their companies and be sustainable. Um, uh, as suppliers. So th those are some of the things that we would need to look at to see why um, it is easier for companies to do that, even though it is hitting procurement and it does not lead to higher procurement scores. Um, but at the end of the day, we do know that enterprise and supply development are critical to the growth of BE, to the establishment of Black-owned companies uh, and 80% black women owned companies, but it matters the types of initiatives that are being offered. It matters uh, whether the, in, the, the intention is to have impact or the intention is to get scores, because over time, all we're going to get is the same things that we're seeing right now and not much of an improvement. So I have faith in the community of practice that the, the the groupings, the companies that are involved would be able to come up with much better ways of ensuring that um, uh, enterprise development is reached. So yeah, that was the Sunlam gauge for 2022 and we look forward to sharing with you. Yep. Did you find that useful? I'm glad you did. If you want to read the full report, it is available on Sunlam Transformation Engage.co.za. Just Google it. It'll send you to the site. There's an electronic copy there um, that's available to you. But I'm also going to try and see maybe before we part tomorrow to get some physical copies in the room in case you, you're like me and you still like the paper in your hands. But thank you very much, Lerato. Very interesting uh, outcomes there. I'm pretty sure for many of you, some of the stuff you know. But it's very different when you've got 10,000 uh, scorecards from all sectors and you're able to actually see the empirical evidence, right? Because it's not something you're just talking about now. It's something that's coming out of the research. And for me, a couple of things um, were quite important. The first thing is that overall, we often are, find ourselves in these conversations about whether BE is regressing. And it's very clear that BE is not regressing. Uh, by all indications, it's improving, but it's at a very slow pace. And the real issue here is the slow pace of transformation and not whether or not companies are reporting um, transformation, i.e. they're on the journey, they're doing what they're doing. And then so far as it relates to ESD, 65%, you saw, I think it was 64 and a half percent to be exact. And that, that, so you would have seen what Lerato was saying is that we, you know, for the research, we've indexed or pegged all the targets at 100% so that you're able to compare. So for example, if ownership, target is 25% black ownership or 30% black women ownership, whatever it may be, we've called that target 100%. So if you reach it, you, are, you reach the target, right? Until of course it changes. And ESD and every other element has got its own targets. And to think that we still, because I don't think it gets spoken enough, have an issue of companies not fully utilizing the ESD points that are available to them. 
which also talks to the spend, et cetera, and their ability to do so. So if we're at 65% of the target, there might be some real challenges we need to talk about because it means we have 35% we're not hitting. If, even before we talk about the issue of impact, just at spend, we're clearly punching below our weight. So I'd be interested to hear what the panelists have to say about that. Um, none of the sectors reach their targets. You saw that, that was an interesting slide. So if you belong to a particular sector, all you're looking at is how far am I from, is my industry from its target, but none of them have reached those targets. Um, and I really enjoyed the issue about the graduation from your QSEs. DG, we need to talk about um, small businesses versus, um, shall we call them um, entrepreneurial businesses. You know, even Google was once a small business, but you know, very few businesses intend on staying small. All of them start small. So is it correct that we almost disincentivize ESD when a black business grows to a certain size and graduates one from EME to QSC and then eventually out of QSC? Is that right? Because I guess that was written so that the focus is on very small businesses. But is it right that as and when I get capacity and I grow and some of the companies in this room give me work and I'm now starting to stabilize, I should no longer be a focus of development. Is that, is that what we want? Um, are we ready for that? that? That's going to be an interesting discussion. And then my favorite, one of my favorite ones is the black women ownership. Um, I often hear how practitioners really struggle to find enough black women ownership or qualifying black women ownership owned businesses at, at this 30%. Well, how are we doing there? What's the problem? Is, is 30 too little, is 30 too much? Where are the women? I've, I've, I meet black business women all the time, but procurement always says they can't find them. So what's the problem? So we should, we should also talk about that. So thank you very much to Lerato for, for bringing the facts into this conversation. And I, I hope that you will all make time to attend whether in person or online at the launch of the 2023 version. She'll be on stage again, um, where she'll be talking about what the research has said. Just a short break. Somebody has decided to donate to me their how train card. Um, I do have a flight to catch later, so thank you. But if you really need it back, <laughs> please come to me. Uh, the team has found this somewhere on the floor. I'm sitting right here. So if you can't find your card, this is probably yours. Right, I'm now going to move on to our final presentation before our tea break. And um, it's a, a, a lady that comes with a great experience insofar as it relates to the space of um, ESD that we're talking about. And um, she's gonna be speaking about the big five top real world challenges for practitioners, right? So we are focusing on the big five top challenges for practitioners. Um, she is the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Transformation Manager at Sanofi Aventis. Somebody who's quite passionate about the space of communities and ED and uh, 10 years experience in the transformation space as a consultant for four years, and then working in various departments, uh, rather industries such as engineering and pharmaceuticals. Um, she focuses a lot on strategies and implementation of those strategies insofar as employment equities concerns, skills development, and preferential procurement. And uh, she's also project managed ESD programs and incubator programs for various partners in her career. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the Transformation Manager at Sanofi Aventis, South Africa, Ms. Mbali Shabalala. Good morning, everybody. Um, all protocol observed. My name is Bali Shabalala, um, as introduced by the speaker. And I will be focusing um, on the top five real challenges that practitioners face in the space of BE transformation, whether you're working as a consultant with clients or if you're working in corporate as a transformation manager. I think our, our, our issues uh, are related and we can all identify with each other um, what we go through. So we're gonna start 
with the first one, and I think this is the most important one, we, we now speak about the tick, the tick box exercise. So I think the most frustrating thing that you will find as a practitioner is that you do this nice plan for your client or your business, and you present it to your management and you get told that there's no budget. <laughs> you get told there's no budget, but you are there to implement the BE strategy. Um, the month before financial year end, you get called in. Uh, we need to achieve a level three in Bali. How much do we need to spend? <laughs> how many of you have experienced that? Huh? Yeah, so how much do we need to spend? Now, all of a sudden, there's money. So where did this money come from? <laughs> so um, I think that encompasses what we would call a tick box exercise, because what it's essentially saying is that it's not a business strategy. It's an external objective that is seen as a nice to have in order to get government business or to satisfy customers that require your BEE compliance. And with this happening, I think previous 10 years, it's been a, a go away. Corporates are thinking this is going to go away eventually. BEE was only for 10 years. And then now 2013, the new codes come in. When is it going away? And when is it going away? And it's not going away, um, as the previous speaker has mentioned. And in fact, more changes and more legislation is being introduced to ensure that we enforce this and ensure that we get to the targeted transformation that we all want to see in this country. So the first thing um, that I've realized that which is very important that education goes a long way um, within your company. So lobbying your senior management, because if, if you don't get their buy-in, you're not going to get very far because every BU is managing their targets, they're managing their budgets, and your BE actually is on the back foot until they need you for a tender. And why are we not a level four? Why are we not a level three? You know. So then you have to sensitize to say, but this is not my job alone. It's a business objective. And this is how we should measure it. Um, we should integrate it into our business strategies to ensure that it is sustainable, first of all, because it can be an expensive exercise if you're gonna do it ad hoc year on year. And so with running the ESD programs, um, it's also, it was also an imperative that companies need to look at their supply chain, look at your needs, like Rato expressed in her presentation, that you need to do a gap analysis. What is your need and how you're going to fill that need by empowering a black business and not only a small business, we can start small, but the intention is to grow the business to being a key player in your supply chain. And that's how then they will build up other small businesses in order for us to continue um, on this value chain. So our second um, challenge is obviously access to the supply chain. So how does one ensure that procurement teams are aligned to the vision and strategy and strategic mission um, of the company in terms of the transformation supply chain? So now you've got this nice ESD program, you've got your incubator program, you've got your beneficiaries in there. And once they are in there, now what do you do with them? Because now your supply chain is saying, well, if you work for a global, um, a global corporate, you get told that there's global contracts that you have to comply with. They've been negotiated up country, so there's nothing you can do about it. So there comes another challenge where it also now becomes a tick box exercise again, where you've got this incubator program, you're getting your ESD points, and then your graduation factor, now you're putting through one entity so that you can get that one point, but that entity stays hanging there. One transaction, and then they're fallen by the wayside. The next year again, you have to pick up on the same. And now it's another case of, so now who do we graduate this year? So you're constantly scrambling for points, which is not fair to the company, which is not fair to um, the beneficiaries themselves. So how do we, how do we then ensure this alignment? So as a no fee, um, what we did was to basically lobby um, within the organization locally, but also go up country to our senior management and um, at our corporate office in France to say, we've got to be objective in the country to advance transformation. And it's not only um, a, 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 a public sector um, imperative, but it also of benefit to us as a business in terms of having access and putting our products in the right shelves and retain and, and, and actually getting a market share and retaining revenue from um, some of the products that we offer. 
because um, Sanofi does a lot of work in the public sector space, but we are unable to get into those tenders because why? Our compliance level was lacking. And this obviously became an ongoing conversation and until we knocked on the right doors and we had the right ears hear us. And as it stands, then we were then given that relaxation to say, okay, fine, let's put together a strategy. Let's see what you guys can do and what we can achieve. And the, the, the outcome of that is that the company moved from being a non-compliant to a level seven and now a level five and actually getting 39 points on the ESD points um, scorecard element. And how that was achieved is that we went in and looked at the categories of spend that we could then transform as a start. And then we aligned our beneficiaries to that strategy to ensure that we have sustainability and we integrate them into the business and we're not gonna forget about them next year. We're gonna be scrambling for points again. Um, and we've been running that model successfully for the past two years. And I think that that is how you will then tackle the issue with your supply chain and ensuring that everybody's on board with what the objective of the company is. Now we talk about funding. So this is a big, big, <laughs> so this is a big, big thing. Um, and we know that our, our SMEs fail um, for the first three years um, and SMMEs survival is determined by the first three years. And access to capital is a big problem, um, as mentioned by previous speakers. And the, the issue with that is that we find an SME today, and after finding them today, to get our points, and then we dump them and move on to the next one. And so the, 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 so we need to we need to look at more sustainable funding methods. So it's a case of instead of giving fish, then you teach how to fish. And I think the right partners, your right implementation partners, and actually skills development goes a long way in ensuring that you educate your beneficiaries in terms of how to manage their, fin their finances so that they have a good um, balance sheet where you can actually present them to a finance institution and actually have them get that advantage um, of them ultimately being able to be self-sustainable um, in continuing their, their business operations. And I think the most important one, um, the monitoring and evaluation. So with this one, businesses sometimes we just dump money in and then we walk away. And then we'll say that this is not working. And I think the whole recycling of different people on different ESD programs, they also get addicted to that. It's like the learnership model. You know, you've got professional learnership learners <laughs> so if, you, if you're doing persons with disability training, um, you'll have these people this year and then you'll see them again in another program and then you'll find them again in another company, you know, so it becomes that repetitive cycle where we, we, we're not actually watching how we are holding um, not only SMEs accountable to the companies that fund them, because sometimes it can become an entitlement spirit that because you're getting BE points, you have to give me this money. You know, and then because it's for BE points, I don't have to manage it. I can just walk away. And then that becomes a problem as well because now the company is looking at me and saying, where's the return on our investment? You know, so it's, it's, it's very important that even with that, KPIs need to be put in place to say, SME, we're gonna walk with you this journey and this is what we are going to do with you. But then you are also accountable to the company for this. If there's loans in place that have been given to the SME, hold them accountable to their, to their repayment terms. Um, and it's the only way that we are actually going to see this wheel moving and we actually all going to be able to work together in creating this shift that is going to determine the success of the ESD program as it's, it's not only um, as the DG mentioned that it's not a, a government um, problem alone, but it's for all of us because all of us are part of this ecosystem where we want to see success, we want to improve the unemployment rate in the country, um, we want to get rid of this um, crime that is um, plaguing our country due to the high numbers of unemployment. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's exciting times to actually be a South African because with all this 
um, shift that is happening with our legislation. I know the Department of Health is now imposing stricter regulations on us as pharmaceuticals with regards to our compliance. Um, so now with the tenders, we are now being held to the, to the new EE bill that has been um, sent out for draft for commentary, the draft that has been sent out for commentary. Um, and that's what we want to be measured on. Now our employment equity goals, every year when we tender, we need to submit that certificate to say, are we meeting our goals that we have actually set out to achieve in our plans? So even that is no longer going to be a tick box exercise, but it's actually going to be a measurable element that will determine if we get through the door. So at that point, our B certificate will take a, a second seat, whereas this EE compliance has to come in first to say, are you actually empowering your staff? Are you actually doing what you need to do from a labor um, perspective? And with the preferential procurement as well, ESD is also a big focus. Now you have to prove how many South African companies you are actually empowering in your supply chain and how many of them are actually graduating um, from your ED, from your supplier development, and actually how you sustain in them um, as a business. And I think those key focus areas um, are really empowering to us as practitioners as well, because then our job becomes more enforceable. Um, whereas before you could just be sidelined and be like, yeah, well, look, we'll talk to you next year when we need to do this again. But you, now you become part of the business strategy, you work with each department. And yeah, so I think for me, it's, uh, it's been a great opportunity. And I thank you very much for your attention. The excellence is flowing in this room, hey? Another round of applause from Bali. I took a picture of, of, one, of one of the things that she said near the end of her presentation. I'd like to just reread it. The dynamic of South Africa is that though we know not everybody is meant, is meant to be an entrepreneur, too many people are forced into entrepreneurship as a means of survival. Attrition will occur and is more easily accepted if it can be quantitatively shown that even after development interventions, the SME does not have the cognitive ability to show any level of success. So we must be kind to ourselves. Ne? We must accept that it won't always work out, even though we've really tried. Hey, that was very sobering. Another round of applause for Mali. <laughs> okay, so we spent the morning reflecting. We spent the morning getting some experts to share their insights with us. Started with Lita, and then our DJ came, Lindo Wutle, and we've now heard from Larato and Mali giving us some stats and some real experiences on the ground about some of the challenges that are faced by practitioners. We're gonna take a tea break. Now, for a couple of minutes, I'll tell you exactly how much we have. And then we'll get back and have our first panel discussion. Now, our first panel discussion is entitled, A Tough Job in Rough Times, Implementing ESD Programs That Build Sustainable Supplier Relationships. So amongst all the supports that you give us, SMMEs, we really thank you. At the end of the day, we want you to help us become a sustainable business that supplies you with our products and our services, and you pay us for our products and our services. And then from supplying you, we can take that little profile and experience and hopefully go to other people that can buy our products and services. We are not here for us to be perpetual uh, recipients of your good nature. We just want a leg up. But at some point, the rubber must hit the road. There must be work. Otherwise, I'd be trained out of my mind with all the skills, but I can't sell what I'm supposed to sell. So we're going to focus on how do we create sustainable supplier relationships straight off the tee. It is 10.56, and um, I'm already behind on my program. So I'm going to be a Democrat. You have two options. We can still stick to a 30-minute tea, which feels very long to me or we can make it 15 minutes so we can still feel it a short time. All those in favor of 15 minutes, say aye. <laughs> Lovely, what great democracy you guys have. We'll be back in the venue at 11.15.
the tea is being served um, at the tea station. Let me just confirm, Odette, is the tea here? Same area where we all had the coffee this morning. Okay, great. So where you saw the coffee this morning is where we'll have our tea break. 11.15, I'll be back on stage. Enjoy.
Is Mr. Joshua joining us? Joshua going once. You can put it here, sir. We might not need it if Joshua is not joining us. Gary, should we proceed without him? Okay, great. You can take the one off, my good sir. No, no, no. You can take this one off for now. Just put it on the side over there for me. Yeah, you can take it off. Thank you. There was another microphone. Ah, you've got one. You've got one. You guys will share that one. Great stuff. Do we have microphones for the audience? Or are they going to have to swipe from us? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We are kicking off our panel discussion. As already discussed, we're going to have some conversation here on the floor. And then we will obviously open it to you guys as um, the rest of the audience. Um, any questions you might have for our panelists? Any comments you'd like to make? I will keep checking in with you to make those contributions. The theme of our panel discussion is a tough job in rough times, um, implementing ESD programs that build sustainable supplier relationships. I think just before we get going, let's start with some introductions. One of the things I hate doing in this job is introducing people who are already in the room to introduce themselves. Because inevitably, I will not know as much about you as you do. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with you, Maud, since you've got the microphone. Um, you just flick it, you know, there's a little zero and one. You just move it to the one. You got that? Got it. Cool. Do you want to test it? Testing? Testing one to one. There we go. There we, you've always wanted to say that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to say that. I've never been an MC, so <laughs> that's your job. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Welcome, Maud. Um, quick introduction of yourself, your kind of experience in all matters ESD, and um, maybe also some general opening comments on the issue of sustainable supplier relationships because that's kind of the focus so we, we, we're less about kind of the development side we're more about the procurement side intro and maybe your opening thoughts okay. um uh, hi everyone i'm Maud mudise general manager for enterprise and supplier development for the Shoprite group my take on sustainable um supplier relations and development or not development is intent for both parties um, there has to be a strategic alignment, as Mbali mentioned earlier, that it, ha it has to be something that the group knows this is where we're going, but also support from the SMME or the supplier side as well. It has to be both aligned, but also, most importantly, it has to be profitable for both parties. That's how you, you develop a sustainable relationship. Mm -hmm. But other than that, maybe that's something that we can deal with, deal with later is how do we then develop sustainable supplier relations further over and above that EME, QSE, because they tend to come back with problems. Right. How do we solve those problems? Let's also share with us also how you're doing it at ShopRite currently. What kind of programs are you running? Um, I know a lot of your programs are about putting small business owners of products onto your shelves. Just talk a bit more to us about that so it's twofold right you've got the access to market piece where i have a product and i want to put it on yourself right so that's a different program but you've also got a program linked to um strategic alignment this is what we have shortage in the or short in the business who do we onboard that's currently doing it so for instance we were short of tomatoes in the eastern cape we went and found a supplier, grew them from a two hectare to a 12 hectare, created jobs in the process. I think it was about over 50 jobs. But also when that supplier struggles, how do you come in then as a retailer and say, we've got your back, we want to grow with you. How do we come back and, and literally solidify that intent um, with, with that business? So we'll speak more about it as the conversation continues. And yeah. Okay. Let me move over to Busi. Busi is from Coca-Cola Beverages, South Africa. Um, they are the people that bottle all those wonderful Coca-Cola products you love, you love drinking. Busi, quick intro of yourself and your experience in this space. 
your thoughts on sustainable supplier relationships. I know you have extensive experience in that. Uh, good day, everybody. So I'm Wissi Tusi. I'm the head of procurement transformation for Coca-Cola Beverages South Africa. Uh, and in terms of my experience, obviously, I'm experienced in supply development, I'm experienced within procurement, and I'm experienced within finance. So basically, I'm experienced throughout the value chain that we've got. So my thoughts, obviously, in terms of supply development and uh, supply relationships. So supply development is closely related to supply relationship management. It, it is actually a subsection of that when you look in terms of procurement. So um, what is important is the relationship needs to be mutually beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. It cannot just be one-sided. Mm -hmm. We as corporates cannot dictate to the uh, you know, entrepreneurs what development they need to do. So it needs, there needs to be a proper gap analysis mm -hmm. uh, as well as to how to close that. And supply development, I mean, means nothing if it does not result in any economic benefit eventually, you know, or growth for the supplier. So which is why the absorption of suppliers into your supply chain is important. And I think as Coca-Cola beverages, we've, we've done very well with that. I mean, um, when we started, we didn't have an ESD strategy before. And then once we've put it in, we've basically managed uh, to move at that point for the ESD, we're sitting at 60, 16 points. So right now we are maximizing the scorecard. So we've got the 42 points that um, they was highlighted by Lerato and the Sandam Gage, but over and above the 42 points, we've got the four bonus points mm. that are within the ESD buckets. So which means the graduation, points, we get that, the job creation, we've got that, as well as the designated group. So we've got all those points. So basically, all I can say around supply development and supply relationship, it needs to be mutually beneficial and yeah. you need to have the buy-in throughout the business. So from your CEO to the person on the manufacturing line, they need yeah. to buy into the concept. We're going to come back to that because I do know that's often a challenge, eh? Because CEOs and heads of transformation procurement or procurement transformation, they know what needs to be done, but you know, with the factory floor, things may be slightly different. Let me come to Teppo. Teppo, you are a founder CEO of your own logistics business. Um, and uh, no doubt you've had your fair exposure to ESD programs from South African corporates. Your thoughts? Yeah, I did. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think I, I would, I would you know, before I get into it, I'm a great be benefactor of enterprise development. It worked for me. Uh, I, I must have gone through, I think, five, if not six companies. I'm, well, by employment, I'm a CEO of Prima Logistics. Um, I founded this company in 2005. The company is 18 years old now, 10, 18, uh, March 28. I was quite clear when I went into this entity that I'm getting into a very much capital intensive uh, industry. I mean, we, 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 we look for capital to buy our fleet, be it trucks, be it buckies. And we, we have to have warehouses. We have to have IT infrastructure. How do I go about having this? And you know, you, you have a business plan which the banks tend to look at it from the other side. Then I said to myself, I'm going to launch this. And I did. I started with a truck and a dream. There was money available in the form of uh, enterprise development. I just had to know when to look for, who to look for. So the people standing on my left hand side, I really, really, really harassed them. I knocked on their <laughs> doors. And I can share stories as to how Standard Bank took me from just one truck to too many trucks, too many buckies with national presence. Uh, I can share how Vodacom did it. I can share how um, GE did it. I can share how EC, ECIC did it. The list goes on and I had to go. I mean, a lot of people engage one company for an enterprise development, but I engage a multiple of them. Right. So uh, my name is Hepo. I'm also an author. A flautist as well, and I'm looking forward to engage with you. You're an author and a what? 
uh, flautist. What is that? I play flute. I... You play the flute. Oh wow! <laughs> I I distress with my flute. Uh, okay. I think we have to know that you know entrepreneurship is a very lonely chain. Yes. Uh, at times you you would feel that this is not cut for you. You wanna just sleep or you wanna take those <laughs> pills and just yeah. die in that corner and feel sorry for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I wrote a book as well with regards to leaving a footprint for those entrepreneurs yeah. that wanted to oh, awesome. understand how to go about navigating. What's the book called? <laughs> Interesting topic. Uh, um, the 14 year startup. My wife came up with the name of the The 40 year startup. The 14 year startup. Oh. There's okay. a story behind why it's okay. called the 14 year startup. It's a it's a webbook. It's gotcha. like uh, it's based on the concept who moved my cheese. It's an entrepreneurial book. Okay. It's lessons on how to go about building a legacy business. Okay. And what is the person who plays a flute called again? A flautist. I can guarantee you 90% of the people <laughs> in this audience have no clue what is a flautist. Yeah, no, I had yeah. to be the one to look like an idiot as you ask. <laughs> but I'm actually saving all these people here. <laughs> yeah, tonight at dinner, they're all coming home. Hey, sweetie, do you know what a flout is? <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank you very much, think... Tepo. All right, let's move to Mr. Memani. We, we, we know this gentleman well. He's been involved in matters that are relating to small business for a long time. From the perspective of the DSPD, uh, uh, Bramzi, just take us through... Your own thoughts, number one, and some of the key programs the department is spearheading. Good, mon good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for that. Good morning there. <laughs> J just to pick up a small point from Tsepo on, on harassing uh, corporates. I think there's always that fear from, from small businesses is either they are so mild in knocking at various doors or they are too aggressive and almost venturing on, on, on being rude. And I think our own advice is always, there's nothing wrong in knocking at many doors because at least out of those hundred doors you knock at, one of them will open. Yeah. So as DSPD, we obviously have a huge mandate. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get the statistics correct. I, I, I know the surveys we're relying on are not giving us good data. Um, so if, 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 if at, a, at, a, at a liberal level, we're sitting at 3.2 million small businesses, including micro and, and, and informal businesses. So it's a huge scope of work we have. And if all of them uh, look for market access, um, it, 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 it is a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, and, and, and engaging all the corporates that we talk to in the department, you will realize uh, only very few small businesses can make it, uh, be it on the shelves of pick and pay, shop right, spa, getting linked to Coca-Cola, getting linked to Exaro and other big entities. Only very few of the small businesses we, we work with. So one program which, which I believe um, we, we pioneering uh, since 2020 is the, is the localization program, which has various components. So it has components of um, assisting small businesses to be competitive and, and produce products of good quality with the support of the entire ecosystem, including our entities, CEDA and CIFA that are there uh, to provide instruments uh, to these businesses. And I think and um, the, the, the second program, we, we, which I want to believe is, is, is very crucial to us, is, is the supplier development program. Yeah. So this is the program where we are empowering uh, suppliers uh, to get all the training they need. And I think this morning there was emphasis on skills development. Yeah. Skill businesses give them education, give them the knowledge. They must be able to interpret their own business plan, even though it may have been developed by a consultant but let the entrepreneur uh, have the know-how of my business from, from the financial models I used uh, right through to, to, to HR issues, to IT, because those are all the management competencies a, a business owner needs. So I want to believe that supplier development program is, is really positioned um, 
in the right direction uh, to, to work closely with corporates and to, to work closely with the entire ecosystem, all the partners uh, that can back up uh, uh, businesses. And uh, perhaps the last program uh, we run is obviously funding, yes. uh, because we do believe um, funding instruments are very key and crucial. In this ecosystem, the unfortunate thing is we don't have a huge budget we, we operate from, um, so it's quite limited. But I want to believe we, we set up uh, strategic partnerships with other DFIs. Um, so if the funds we provide to the ecosystem are not sufficient, we will tap the other support from your NEF, ITC, and a whole range of other provincial agencies that are also there to support small businesses. But I think for me, the fact that we are here today also gives us an opportunity to say to our private sector counterparts, though as government we're putting together funding, we need to complement yeah. uh, that funding. So I think in, in, in today and tomorrow, those are some of the, the areas we want to explore. Yes. So when it comes to funding between government and the private sector, what can we do to work together? And I think from the BEE Commission report and the Sunlam Gage report and our SMME funding policy, there are proposals we're putting forward in the area of funding to okay. say, how do we assist small businesses to, we'll, to progress? We'll come back to see if I and CEDA is in your world. That's correct. correct. That's All correct. right. So we're going to come back to talk about funding, but I almost want to take the four of us through the journey of an SMME coming to a big South African corporate and bidding for an opportunity, right? So in the early stages in Tempo, I know you remember those days 18 years ago. Um, Maud, I know that you spearheaded ShopRite's ESD capability. So you kind of in the early days, I guess, as a corporate. Busi, you've been at this for a long time. You tell the story of how CCBSA was at certain level and how you've driven that growth. Um, Z, you're quite experienced on all policy matters. But let's go through the journey of this SME. And let's talk about some lessons and some frustrations. Because, you know, we are in the audience here. We want to be better. We don't want you to tell us we're problem children without a solution. We want to be problem children, but we want solutions. In the early days, I've observed that, especially big corporates, struggle to onboard small businesses because big corporates are used to dealing with other big corporates. And small businesses can be just frustrating because they are small businesses. The requirements of certain contracts are almost written in such a way that they assume or they expect the small business to be up there. Busi, let me start with you on your lessons and experience in getting these SNMEs into the big world, a complex world of the manufacturing plants of Coca-Cola beverages and having a chance and even a shot at getting the contract that would probably normally go to somebody bigger or somebody with more experience. What are some of the, the lessons you can share with us and the things maybe we as SMEs can start doing or stop doing so that we can get our foot in the door? Um, what I found is a lot of small businesses don't take compliance seriously. Compliance? Yes. So obviously, I mean, we, we're part of a global brand, you know, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And we've got what is called a recam, so which is basically process and procedures that we have to abide with from right. Atlanta. So we have tried to modify it there and there, obviously, to cater for small business. But I mean, basic things like you no know, tax compliance, if you need to be tax compliance, or if you come for funding, you know, having financials. So we find that sometimes people take shortcuts on that. Mm. And you find that some of them, we obviously we educate, they go through enterprise development, we educate them on these requirements and then we onboard them. Mm. But when things get tough for them, the first thing that they will try and cut cost on is compliance. Wow. You know, um, I mean, if you look at TEPO here, TEPO is in transport. So for you to do business with us, you need to have some insurance because you carry our product. It's our brand. It's associated with it. Right. We sometimes find people defaulting on insurance. Wow. 
you know, which negatively impacts us. You find people obviously defaulting on sex, you know, and not paying their taxes. Wow. And unfortunately, some of our contracts are such that if you default and you can't get into an arrangement with sex, yeah. it's a dismissible offense. So you can take away my contract? Yes, you can take away your contract. So what we normally do is we even put in business advisors to help you through the team to make sure that, you know, you comply. So that is that. And another challenge that, you know, I find with small suppliers is we don't think holistically in terms of the challenges that South Africa is facing, right? Which is inequality, unemployment, and poverty. And obviously part of us promoting entrepreneurs is mainly for job creation, right? So now you find people that instead of sourcing or producing locally, they will go and try and buy you something from China and come and sell it for you, right. to you. Right. So in, instead of them, you know, equipping unemployment pe unemployed people in the communities to produce that. So that is basically some of the issues. And I think the last one is around mindset. Is a lot of entrepreneurs, once you see yourself as small, you will always be small. Mm. Mindset is important. You need to have that mindset that, yes, I might be small, but in future, I see myself big. Wow. Yes. We're going to come back to the localization point because I'm interested in your views on that. But Maud, let me come to you because your compliance is, 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 is goes beyond SARS and that type of compliance because we eat the stuff, right? So your potatoes that you had to find for Eastern Cape, those potatoes better be good and meet all the requirements. What's been your experience in dealing with SMEs on that level of compliance? Andile, if you look at the applications that come through our portal for SMMEs that want access to market and the ones that we end up onboarding, it's shocking. It's about, I think, an 80% dropout rate because of compliance. Compliance is not only difficult, but also expensive. What do you mean? So basically, you have to get a food safety certificate for wherever you're manufacturing, for instance. And I think these are the conversations we have with MZ and their teams and all of that in terms of how do we make it easy for SMMEs to get a basic compliant in, a compliance certificate in order for them to be, feel comfortable enough to stand in front of us and say, I've ticked the boxes, come and see what you need to see. Yeah. I'm fine with that. So Busi's obviously addressed the compliance part. What we also found was that it was very difficult for SMMEs to approach us because we give them buyers that deal with the multinationals, the Tiger brands, Unilevers, you name them, yeah. right? So, I mean, as a small I mean, business, I'm just Andile. I'm just Andile with my potatoes. Right. <laughs> But I mean, if you if you if you look at that, it's already a certain type of gap that exists between yeah. this buyer who is trying to understand the landscape of this supplier, but also the supplier trying to understand the landscape of that yeah. buyer. We established a division that basically deals with small suppliers that handholds them through the process of actually growing into retail. What we've also found is that starting small is actually very valuable in the beginning, because if I give you a national deal. One mistake can cost you a lot more than if you started with five, got in our learnings, then expand and grow gradually throughout the whole process. So patience for me is one thing, because if you come with your own brand yeah. and you're saying this is the best acha I have, for instance, for yeah. example, not everybody knows it. Yep. Um, we found that a cash trap consumer would rather pay two rand more for a legacy brand, knowing that this will take me through the month, I can't afford to make a bad mistake. Yep. No matter how low priced your price, your product is, I will pay two rand more because I know this will take me through the month. My family will be fed. I will be fine. I don't take any yep. risk. Rather than if I buy this cheaper product and it doesn't taste good, nobody in my family likes it, I'm going to have to make another plan wow. and pay more school fees on it, right? So we have to do the work in terms of introducing your product to the market, making people comfortable and safe around it. I mean, one of the case studies that we found was one of the suppliers in the Western Cape, they produce jam. When they approached us, they had already established a market base in the Western Cape like no other that when we put their product on our shelf, it actually sold out within wow. days. 
So it helps to have those SMMEs that come to you and say, I've done my research. I've got five years. I know where my customer base is at. Yeah. I know what price point I need to come at. I know um, what is the lowest I can go in terms of my cost. Because the other mistake that SMMEs make is to say, I can give you this for cheaper, it's fine. But you don't take into account that you'll get a lot more volume, but you'll get a lot more losses in the end because you're not making money out of that product. Absolutely. Um, so retail specifically us, because we're a low cost retailer, pricing is important, but make sure that you've got your businesses back in that sense as well. Got you. Because you won't grow if you're not profitable as well. So those are the challenges and the issues that our, our division obviously takes those small suppliers through in order to gradually grow them into the business. Why, why, why did you set up, because I find that interesting, a separate almost buying division for the smallest guys? I mean, did you find that the regular buyer who's, who's used to the Tiger brands and the Unilevers was struggling now to deal with this Tepo guy? in these five tracks 10 years ago there's a gap yeah. the gap is too much you need yeah. somebody who understands that it will take me two weeks sometimes to get information because i'm an owner-run business yeah um i don't have the systems and processes in place yeah but also somebody who will guide you through the process and say your product does not your labeling specifications are incorrect because of one two three four Go five fix this. that's why i can't put it on the shelf gotcha. Go to this company that can assist you to actually uh, fix that. Uh, so usually you just say, ah, it doesn't comply. Moving on, next supply. Let me phone Tiger Brands. Yeah, yeah, so it really helps to have people on the ground that understand that it's not just a tick box exercise to say yes, 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 but there's other people that need help. They've got generally good products. It's the knowledge surrounding gotcha. it. Gotcha. Uh, and that's what Busi spoke about in terms of equipping yourself with that knowledge in order for you to be able to get your foot in the door. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Tapo, I'm sure this is rolling back the years for you, brother. I'm so you sitting there and you're reminiscing. Which, oh, I remember those days. <laughs> Share with us. Oh, yeah. Uh, quite intense. I mean, um, 18 years being an entrepreneur has not, has not been an easy journey. And I often share with entrepreneurs the challenges that I've faced. And you know, when you talk about SARS, I've had my share with SARS. <laughs> so uh, I guess I was quite fortunate uh, when I, I put up a unique proposition to Standard Bank to do um, their reverse logistics. Uh, reverse logistics is a subject that no one wants to engage with. What is reverse logistics? You're teaching us a lot, by the way, today, <laughs> Mr. Tempo. All right. Um, I, before I embarked on my entrepreneurial journey, I was, I've gone through the ranks of logistics, yeah. from a logistic clerk to being an executive logistics. And I've worked for Veracom, MT, and CELC. Yeah. So I mean, I've learned a lot. You Reverse logistics is you buy a laptop from, say, uh, Incredible Connection. It yeah. gets delivered to your door. You take a lap you take a box. You throw it away. Uh, you've left with this laptop. You try to power it on. It doesn't power on. Got you. And then you say, "Oh, what am I going to do with this box? Okay. What am I going to do with this laptop?" Now they said your phone in. They said bring it back. Right. You don't have a box. Your typical courier does not pick okay. up. Okay. Okay. Now Prima Logistics picks up. Okay. So. Got it. This is a value proportion that I've sold to Standard Bank. And right. I just want to, you know, share with you how I've, how I've gone up. And I'm not saying people should do this, but I did it and it worked for me. I sold the proposition to Standard Bank. It worked. Um, I was growing. Now I needed a lot of vehicles. Funding, you know, bankers would look at you differently and say, hey, but you want 10 buckies. Are you crazy? How are you going to manage them? And I was put from one pillar to the other and I got so frustrated and said, I'm going to find the CEO of Standard Bank. It sounded a bit crazy. I said, I've had so many doors closed on me. This one is closing, but that one is going to open. And I camped outside Simon Street there because I was working there and I had an access. I could go through the building because I was collecting reverse logistics for Standard Bank. But I found my way through him and I pleaded for a meeting with him. He saw me yeah. and he said to me, Tepo, uh, you've been trying to see me. And I said, yes, Sam, Sam Chavalan. I said, yes, I've been trying to see you. He said, I don't know, your bank is misaligned. Uh, I'm offering these unique services to you. And you guys are giving me national uh, business. You say, I must do this thing national, but you don't want to give me vehicles. Wow. And then he said, okay, hold on. He picked up the phone. He called someone and says, don't we have an enterprise development here? They said, yeah, we do, sir. He said, okay, call that uh, person to come into my office. Came in and he said to me, 
Do you know this gentleman? He says, no. He said, this is one of our suppliers. He says, we don't want to give him vehicle, but we give him work. Are we misaligned here? Long story short, uh, I was put into an enterprise program, a development program. Oh, I was not tax compliant. Yes. Uh, I had no financials. Yes. Um, I basically, I was just good at just moving things. So they put me through an institution called ORIC. Yes. Uh, Pavlo. Yes. And then it was a four-year program. Four? Four-year program. Four? Yeah. Wow. Uh, now, Pavlo, I remember when I met him, he said to me, okay, Tepo, you've been very much in the engine room. Now you're going to be on the engine room. You're going to manage the engine room. You're going to look at it. You're going to be on. I says, what is he talking about? <laughs> I mean, I've got a degree. I've worked in logistics. I know this too. Yeah. They're wasting my time through this four-year program. But how, how the program was beneficiary, uh, there was an operation module. There was an accounts module. There was a sales and marketing module. Four years. I had to bring my financial manager. I had to bring my sales marketing manager. I have to, they said, oh, you don't even have a tax clearance. But Santa Bank didn't say no to me because I didn't have it. They said, we're going to put a program together so that you can get it. Got you. And I went to that intense program. I mean, well, I got the tax clearance within six months. So I, I understand uh, what they're talking about when SMMEs are not compliant. I've gone through that journey. Um, the problem with some of these SMMEs that are not compliant is some of them are, are, are probably in the, that they're doing this business with the wrong intentions. Gotcha. I went in there to set up a legacy business. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew how I was going to leave my bread. I mean, I can tell you, Andy, now, Monday to Friday, I wear my bread. You'll never see me wearing any other shirt. Even now I'm wearing my shirt. Even my bag that I'm holding, my main bag is Brima. Uh, my jacket. Because if I come to you and say I'm very extremely passionate about this business, if I'm wearing uh, Michael Kors here, yeah. you're probably not going to take yeah. me seriously. <laughs> but if I wear Brima Logistics, you'll take me very seriously. So yes, there are, there are other uh, enterprise development managers that look at this business differently and say, let's, let's twist him. Let's, let's play with this. Let's understand who's the, who's the entrepreneur behind Got you. this entity. Got you. Thank Got you, Zeppo. Z, how do we support this entrepreneur, this SME at that early stage? Um, he's had some intervention and support, he's ready to go, but he's struggling with what's required to get in. How? That's a big elephant in the room. Um, in South Africa, we obviously still have a long way to go, especially when you talk to startups and early stage businesses. So that's where we, we, we still have huge gaps. And I think even when we consider our own programs, we'll look at someone who at least is considered an established business. In other words, this person has been in business for, for a minimum of three years. But if, if, you, if you rock up and, and, and say, I still have this idea, um, I, I need support, it, it, it's not gonna be easy. Um, possibly, you know, we do talk of, of, of igniting the spirit of entrepreneurship. Yes. Um, and, and when those entrepreneurs arise and approach us, it, it's never easy because now the, 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 the pockets of support are not coordinated. They are all over the, the shore. And I think our approach uh, also through this policy dialogue is, 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 is also to foster very strategic partnerships so that where there are gaps, at least we know we might not necessarily be able to satisfy and reach out to every startup and early stage business, but there are other partners right. who, who can come in and, 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 and fill in the gaps. I mean, uh, there's uh, right at the back, there, there, there is a, a, um, an academic from Vets Business School. We've seen universities in this country also coming up with specific programs to support student entrepreneurship. Yes. In fact, UKZN, and I'm sure there could be other academic institutions that set a budget. Yes. Uh, UKZN set a budget of 5 million and said, we, we're going to support um, these student entrepreneurs yes. so that at least they have some startup capital. Yes. So, so the issue of startup capital really needs the, the entire ecosystem uh, to rally behind um, because sure. the, the, the need is, is massive, it's huge. Then, then the SME goes in, next level now. 
he, he, he's uh, harassed Sim Shabalala. He's gotten the, the, the contract. He solved his funding problem in, by harassing Sim. But many entrepreneurs end up in the value chain. I become a supplier and now I must build our relationship. You give me work and let's imagine technically I'm able to deliver on the work. And then the growth comes. Then I need funding. How are you as practitioners solving the scaling and the growth problems that suppliers go through? Because, you know, it's one thing to start a business. You know, anyone here that owns a business, by the way, and I'm sure Tepo would agree with me. When you start running a business, you start running a business for 18 years, you realize how easy it is to start. It's so easy to start a business. I know it sounds weird. What's really hard is to run one successfully. That's hard. So let's imagine what you thought is the hard part you've already done. Now I'm in Coke, but now I've got these trucks, I've got these employees and I'm struggling, I need money. What are some of the challenges you've seen? Once again, same question um, from us as SMEs once we're in the value chain. Um, so some of the problems that I've encountered for suppliers that we've already onboarded is, okay, that's why supplier relationship management is important because some try and hide the fact that they're struggling ah. financially because they think it's going to reflect bad on them. And I mean, there's some that come up and say, you know, I am struggling. So what has been done as much as we part of a global company, we've got that concession in terms of black owned EMEs and QSEs to relax payment terms. You know, so there's suppliers that we even pay immediately, but most of them we try and we pay within the 14 days. 14 to days. make sure that you know the cash flow is there. And some some we pay immediately. So depending on wow. obviously which sector or commodity you are in. Right. So we play around with that. And then over and above that, we've got the Kula Nati SME fund. Right. Right. Which is a fund that we've got, which basically is to make sure and that we can find the growth that is there. So now some of the issues is we've got entrepreneurs that we've put in there and then we've given funding. And then you find that what they had applied for the funds for, they end up not fully utilizing the funds for the purpose. Mm. So, so I have the money, but I don't use it. Yes. So now we've given you the money. It was supposed to help you with your cash flow. And then, no, you decide, actually, I think I need bigger, better offices. You go oh. buy commercial property to invest in that. Oh. So that is some of the issues that, that we, we, we've got. So how we've gone about, obviously, bridging that gap yeah. is we've put post-investment support. Right. Because I think that is important. But unfortunately, entrepreneurs might see it as a burden. Because now, once we are there, we want you to submit your financials to us yeah. monthly, yeah. just to make sure that you are use, using the funds for what yeah. you are supposed to be doing. And then obviously, part of supply relationship, we find the gaps. You might find that, okay, you've got a gap in terms of you don't know how to price. Yeah. Because some entrepreneurs, you know, underpriced, thinking that if I've underpriced, that's Price. it. Yeah, yeah. And then you're sitting with me as a procurement professional who understand the supply chain and the value chain is like, there's no way. Then you end up losing business because of that, because it seems to me you have not applied your, your mind. So that's some of the challenges that you know wow. we face. Maud, your side. So, so you're saying, from what I'm hearing, what you saying is if I am struggling with cash flow and I am a supplier, let me build my relationship with the company that's my customer. And if I'm struggling, I must speak up because I may not be aware what the company could do to assist me. I mustn't, I mustn't die there without crying. Okay, comrades, you heard, eh? we must cry. Yeah. What? From my view, it's obviously a business being ready to be funded. Obviously, like you're saying, we are at that point where you are ready to be funded. Yeah. Um, do the projections make sense? in terms of what you predict your growth to be. Yeah. We get those partners in the room and say, does this make sense? Okay. 
um, from then on, does the pricing of it make sense? Because that volume is nothing when there's no pricing, right? You get to that point and you're like, okay, fine. So your operational costs, how are they affected in? It's literally going line by line and making sure that whatever financial assistance you're giving, there is some sort of thought process to it and holding the SMME accountable. And even after giving them that money, after I hear all these horror stories, once we do a transaction, the first few nights you don't sleep because you're like, yes, I'm hoping that person is actually using the money accordingly. Yeah. But I mean, the, 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 the engagement on a monthly basis to say, guys, we have forecasted this, we're not getting there. What are the blockages within our business that we can help you sort out? Right. Right. And with your monthly management accounts that you're submitting and all of that, that will make us see is the money that we actually put into your business coming to fruition or is there a problem? Wow. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's a relationship problem. I mean, it's a relationship aspect where if I put, put in my part, I'm expecting you also to play your part into it. Um, we're going to have hurdles along the way. We yeah. put in money to a supplier where COVID hit and people change their spending habits. Yeah. They weren't paying or they weren't buying all that luxury premium lines that we had thought they would be buying at that point. Yeah. He's out of business. He comes back to you and he says, I need more money. Why do you need more money? I gave you money a year ago. I need money because I'm actually um, trying to figure out another line that will appeal to rather the general masses rather than the premium product. It's also about reinventing yourself. Why is there a problem? Why are we not achieving the objectives that we're saying we're achieving? And how do we adjust according to the challenges that we face? So, so there's an element of me as the SME spending enough time and energy understanding my yes. customers' challenges. Mm. So I must create a relationship where you can share with me and say, Andy, we're struggling with this because then I can go back and potentially come up with solutions. So it is a relationship thing. Business relations as well, because we've got that information. We can see customer spending habits, for instance. If yeah. we're giving you financing to grow within our business, yeah. we've got the information. It's not stuff that you would necessarily know, yes. but it's a collaborative effort to say, this is what we see a trend in the market, or this is what we see as a trend in the market. Based on what we've predicted here, we're not on the right track. We're got heading you. for got you. some sort of um, Humpty Dumpty fell on the wall. <laughs> got you. Tempo, to what extent, how much time and energy do you spend in, in that client relationship and how has it served you over the years? Uh, I spend a lot of time intensively. Uh, you know, I started as an EME, uh, moved up to a QSE. I'm now out of the QSE range for the first time this financial year that we are out now. Round of applause for that. But I was not happy. And of I'll course. Tell you why I was not happy. <laughs> I lose their support. Um, and I think it posed another challenge to say, we, we had a typical case study. Prima is a typical case study to say, how has enterprise development worked? How has that company survived through COVID? How has load shading affected it? What are the new challenges that have faced this company? And I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that all is well, all is not well. But I always say, I, and you're right, to start a company is easy, but to maintain it, it's something else, or to grow it, it's something else. You've gotta be, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to understand that you're going to live with a level of discomfort. Mm -hmm. You're going to be so unhappy in your life. People often tell me that, but you've done great well. I mean, I see your trucks. I see your buckies. I, I see your warehouse. You've got a big warehouse in Jet Park, 400,000, 4,000 square meters. You're taking on your DHLs. You're taking on the DSV. I said, but I spend a lot of time unhappy. <laughs> but when I come in and I see my staff members parking their cars, and I see the month end with those uh, uh, Mr. Delivery coming in and I have a level of comfort to say, let me do yeah, the pain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me take the pain to say, uh, I will be unhappy if I can change 300 families. I employ over hundred staff. Uh, my payroll is headache. Uh, I'm quite happy maybe during the month, but come 31st. I know, we know. You know yeah, yeah I, I don't want to be me. Now, I think there's a lot of companies that have taken on enterprise development. Some of them did it for, for a number of reasons. One yeah. is grandstanding. 
And another one, because they're passionate, maybe let me, sorry, let me not say they're passionate, they are they're intimate about enterprise yes. development. Yes. They want to see this, this entity going and growing. And other do it because of some pressure from some shareholders yep. who said, what are yep. we doing? What are we doing with this yep. buzzword enterprise? And they do it. Now, in my book, I, I put up four pillars, uh, uh, you know, and one of the most important pillar there is, is systems. What keeps the business going? Um, I mean, I partnered with Coca-Cola uh, previously they purchased in excess of 200, 300 books of my books to give to fellow entrepreneurs. And I've been asked to talk to them, to engage, because remember Coca-Cola now is faced with a challenge. They introduced this scheme, which is a brilliant scheme. And they're taking their driver saying, you're now gonna be an entrepreneur. How, do, how does one shift from, yeah. I mean, remember it's something else when you resign and yeah. you go and become yeah. an entrepreneur. But when you get told that you're now gonna be an entrepreneur, yeah. it's something else. Yeah. And yes, I followed Coca-Cola story, the scheme. It's yeah. not one of those that is fronting. It's quite genuine. You can clearly see there's good intentions. Now, the challenge that Coca-Cola has now with their scheme is how do you take those who want to be employed? Because there's still some who says, I want one truck. I still see myself an employee. Yeah. But how do you take them and, 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 and explode them yeah. into, or change their mindset into something that, that's going to be built, built. I mean, something that's going to be great. Uh, remember, uh, entrepreneurs are those people who jump off the cliff and they build a plane on their way down. And not necessarily everybody can build a plane yeah. on their way down. But your programs, your intervention programs, I yes. mean, I'm glad, I mean, I'm hearing from my colleagues here, I wish I was part of an enterprise development in those times. I could have come to you. You would have made my life a little bit easy. But I can tell you where I'm sitting, if you can allow me. It's been a very, very difficult and a depressing journey. Uh, people often to ask me, did Prima choose you or did you choose Prima? I still have not answered that question. Right. People ask me, would you do it again? <laughs> Hey, I'm not sure you're going to do it again. Um, but thank goodness you yeah. did. Yeah, I did when I see, you know, what it has done to people's lives. Yes. I mean, yes. I, I'm the, I was a solo owner of the business. I own 900%. Yes. Some years back, I decided, no, man, I'm alone on the dinner table. Yes. But how do I take this business to the next level? Yes. So then I decided to give 10% to my staff for free. Yes. I gave them just... And there was no buzz buzz about it. Yes. I mean, it was a black owned company uh, that is given 10% to its staff for free. But it, it didn't bother me that much that no one was talking about it because I was yes. trying to set a trend to say, let's all eat. So, I mean, I mean, remember even uh, there was one journalist who said, who wrote an article about this. He said, you are a capitalist with uh, socialist tendencies. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I said, oh, that's a nice way of describing me. But the dream that I sold to them yeah. of dividends, because I said to Patan Gamla, why are you giving us 10%? What does this mean? You know, yeah. I mean, tell a driver that an assistant driver, what are you trying to do? Yeah. He said, listen, it means now I'm no longer going to share the profit. I'm going to take 90, you're going to take 10. Yes. And that's how they bought into okay. it. But now the problem is what? They took it and then COVID came. Okay. You understand? Yeah, that's difficult. So, I mean, in my book, I talk, de I go into detail about how depressed I was with COVID and how I've managed to... We need this book, Chief. It's available online. Um, no, we need it here tomorrow. We must figure <laughs> out a way. We are entrepreneurs. We build things as they fly. Yeah, but, but if I can share the book, just a little bit about the book, who delivers the book. The book is delivered by the very same 14-year startup. Right. So it's not available through exclusive books. Yes. You go online, e black box, and Prima delivers it, and we deliver it. All right, yeah. all right, round of applause on that. Let's move on. <laughs> the reason why I wanted to park the CIFA conversation is because I do think that when it comes to scale, as an entrepreneur, I've done all I needed to do, I've gone through the pain, I've been compliant, as Busi and Mo tell me to be. They've given, take it, give me a, a, a shot with the first contract. I've harassed some Shabalal, but now I need the capital to grow. And I think you know as much as I do that a lot of SMMEs are struggling with our DFIs when it comes to financial support. Banks have a role 
Bramzi. But they come to close a gap when I'm already moving. I need an overdraft, vehicle finance, but I've already got an income statement. I'm easy, I'm low risk. But in the early days, I'm still high risk. I need my DFI. What have you seen as the challenges from the SME side of why they can't get the likes of CIFA, NEF, and many others to support in that early stage? I think the key problem there is, is, is it, 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 it goes back to the, to, it, to the issue of capitalization, that um, if, if, if we lend this money to the enterprises, is it going to come back? Yeah. I think that's the headache for, for, for the DFIs. Yeah. So you ask any of them, you ask CIFA, NEF, ITC, and any other entities, their headache is, if I give you this money, am I getting it back? Right. Because I need to take this money and lend it to, to other entrepreneurs. And, 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 and so last week, as a, as, as a DSPT portfolio, we obviously had a, a strat plan where we deliberated on these challenges yep. and resolved that. Um, so number one, perhaps um, a DSPT should champion and, 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 and and spearhead the, 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 the aspect of startup funding, uh, early stage funding, hence the publication of the SMME funding policy right. uh, approved by cabinet last year to say, let's now take this uh, forward because it's really, uh, it's clearly a challenge for a whole lot of new entrants into the market Absolutely. that and, are struggling and, to get And funding. I understand it, Bramzi, it's a risk question, right? Yeah. So maybe a conversation that ought to be had at that level is about, Let's assume and let's agree what our risk appetite is. And let's agree that we are filling in this particular level of the risk. Because beyond this stage, two, three years after this, Maud and Busi have been giving uh, 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 Prima all the work. There's a point where I don't really need a new TFI because I'm bankable now. You've de-risked me, yeah. but I need someone to de-risk me in those early stages. Maud? I think it's coming up also with innovative financial solutions. Um, PO financing, um, I've got an order. Can somebody please finance me for this order? Yes. Once I get paid, you get your money back. Um, invoice factoring. If for companies that actually take long to pay SMMEs, that is expensive, but how do we make it affordable for SMMEs within the resources and the DFI yes. space that we have? Yes. I mean, we've come to a point where we pay SMMEs within seven days. Um, if an SMME needs financing for orders, we help help with that um, at affordable rates as well. So it's innovative financial solutions rather than traditional. Here's 50 million. Go and see Good. what you need yeah. to do. It's also um, adapting and being agile to the market and what SMMEs need at that point in time. Great stuff. I want to fit in some questions because more there's a flight to catch. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to come to you now. Um, Technical, do we need more microphones? Do you need to take mine? Okay. Can I borrow yours, Mzee? Thank you. Would you guys share? Can somebody please help me with the microphone? Thank you, ma'am. Please keep your hands up so I can get to you. Let's start with the gentleman here in front and then go to the lady on your right. Sir, quick and short to the point so I can try and pack as many as I can. Thank you. Good day, everybody. My name is Mohale. My question will go to my lady there, Busi. Uh, says Busi, you as a multinational, having operation here in our backyard, the question is, how easy or how difficult it was to go and sell this idea of enterprise development or rather BE as a whole, your principal there in Atlantic. Yeah. How easy is it to sell BE or in general? Or difficult. Or difficult. All right. You got that question for Busi. Let's go to the lady here, please, Masejo. Ma'am, please keep your hand up. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Tammy Kosher. I, I just want to reflect quickly on what I heard was there's basically three levels of entrepreneurs in terms of procurement. There's getting onto the database. They're staying on the database and getting additional orders. And the third part is scaling your business to be able to get regular orders. I see it's Seppo nodding his head. I'm a 22 year entrepreneur. My husband and I have nine employees between us. 
I also run an NGO. Um, I think the innovative financing solutions is really critical for that next level of entrepreneur. And my question to this community of practice is, was need, what is needed to create those innovative solutions? And how do we fund the post-COVID turnaround and in innovation financing? Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. I'm gonna ask Mzi to pick up the one about the innovative financial solutions. Keep the hands coming. Going once. There's not gonna be another round of questions. Mr. Ngoveni, sir. How are you? Good to see no, you. I'm well, thank you, thank you. Good to see you on the other side of entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, Andile. Well, I think my question goes to probably everyone there. These ESD funds that are created by entities or companies, to what extent do we measure them in terms of their contribution of ESDs that goes into the procurement chain? or the supply chain. Right. In other words, um, do we just contribute funds into these funds? Yeah. And end points? Yeah. And leave them like that? Yeah. Or at some point, do they get measured? And if they do, by who? Great, great question. Measurement, talking about measurement, monitoring and measurement. Anything at the back? Going once, going twice. There's one more at the back. So the measurement one, I'm going to ask Busi, if you don't mind picking that one up, about measuring the funds that are actually spent on ESD. Yes, ma'am. Um, morning, everybody. Oh, afternoon. <laughs> I wanted to find out from the panel, what are the challenges in finding these um, entrepreneurs? Okay. Um, can we maybe consider portals uh, okay. where we can register so you can easily access the list and Great identify question. your- Great Your name, ma'am? Jesse from Radio Limited. Jesse. Yes. Jesse, I'm Z, can you pick up the database one? And then my last question is right, right here. She's had her hand up for so long, she's gonna kill me if I don't point at her. Hello, ma'am. Good day, colleagues. My name is Gladys Shabalala, Sam's sister. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm from an organization called Amina Marula Foundation and Lendo Projects. So mine is merely a concern, right? Um, and a reality that we're facing um, to say that 80% um, of level one organization, qualifying organizations, um, do not really do audit reporting, which is a disadvantage um for the um, organization mostly in terms of the growth and the sustainability and also looking into um you know that also reality to say that we exist in a space where the buying power has you know drastically shifted um one of the panelists they mentioned something about um not being authentic and um you know buying from china you know and bringing here like um, as women as well, it's, 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 you know, we actually also need to put our hands together, you know, as business people and all that, in a sense that it is so disappointing and demoralizing to say that in this state, South Africa, um, there is no female owned, unless if I stand to be corrected, um, manufacturing organization or, can, or, or company that, um, manufacture sanitary towels, which is a basic human necessity for women. You know, we're busy saying we have a gap in women-owned um, entities in terms of your um, manufacturing and all that. But what are we doing as um, SMMEs and as, um, you know, funders in terms okay. of closing that gap? Because we've got this China Okay. that, um, you know, um, you're buying and you're coming here as Gladys and then, then I'm packaging that I'm saying Gladys sanitary towels. Okay. You know? I'll put the question to Mzee, thank you. Yes, ma'am. You know, I, I, I knew you had a question, but you didn't pick up your hand, but you are here now. So I'm going to give you a chance. There you go, Masako, the lady over there. That'll be our final question, ladies and gents. We do need to stay focused on the program. Don't worry, you get more opportunities later. We've got more panels happening through the day. Good morning, colleagues. Yes, ma'am. My name is Fika Mokwana. I'm representing South African women in business and young girls. So 
yeah, we we having a serious challenge uh, in terms of finding uh, getting finances from the banks, from CEDA, GEP. All the time we send applications, but there is this red tape that you must have your five hundred thousand in your bank. And really, we're working with township women and those who who don't even have nothing in their banks. So yeah. we we're requesting to small businesses. And you all colleagues that are sitting in front there that can you please let's collaborate let's make sure that women get more access to funding and another will also request we will be having a women investment conference we're looking for investors guys please colleagues help us thank you ma'am. thank you ma'am all right you've heard all the questions Musi, let's start with the ones i asked you to think about um i think that First question to me was how easy it is for us to sell the B mandate to Atlanta. So yep. for, for us, it has been quite easy. Um, hence, I think just to take you back, my department was actually formed after it was aligned within the department to say, we need to focus on this as a company. So even with some of the recam controls that we've got, um, it is relaxed you know, for black owned EMEs and QSE. So for us, I think it has not Great. been difficult at all. And I think it's not only in South Africa and all the other undeveloped markets that we're operating in. I mean, there's similar programs and yeah. I think the bigger business buys yeah. into that. I mean, if you go to the Coca-Cola website, you'll see all the programs and all the foundations that they run across the world. So that has not been a challenge okay. at all. And I think there was a question around measuring the impact uh, in yes. terms of the ESD funds to make sure that we're just not giving funding without business. So for us, I think guys, I've mentioned um, the Kulanati fund. So the fund is actually, when we started it, it was a supply development fund, which means it was meant for people that are already within our supply chain, but which who needed to scale. So those are the people that we funded. And then what has happened is subsequently we've opened it up to people that are not suppliers, but you need to be a potential supplier. So that is where obviously we need, we might be in a three-year contract, but I mean, we will still need your business plan and check whether it's the potential for us to do business with you, you know, before we even fund it, before we even find you to make sure that we don't have the thing and I mean in terms of measurement I mean on a monthly basis we do measure the impact we do have a team that will even visit the sites just to make sure that now that you are using the funds for the correct thing the impact that you said you were going to create with the fund it is there uh, we we do see that great stuff thanks Musi um, Z, the question around localization was very uh, clear about the fact that we're still finding that we are supplying these businesses with stuff, but we're not making it locally. Yeah, that's a brilliant question uh, from, from Gladys. Um, so as part of implementing the, the localization framework, we've actually identified a list of products that we're importing and that we believe it's doable by SMMEs to manufacture those products locally. So sanitary towels is, is, is one of the top uh, products. So, so we're journeying now, I think, with roughly about 15 SMEs okay. that are currently distributors, but are transi transitioning uh, to become small manufacturers. In fact, one of them, the good news is um, she's already been funded uh, by one of the DFIs to a tune of 50, 42 million to set up a, a, a facility because obviously uh, to run manufacturing is very expensive. Yes. So I do believe uh, uh, this will be announced in due course okay. and, and, and the South African public is going to be aware of that. M may I also really just emphasize the issue of us supporting, even if it's one SMME who starts something, if as a country we can all rally behind that SMME and stop being jealous, uh, because I always, I always sense uh, 
uh, there's jealous and, 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 and say, why this particular enterprise yeah. Yeah. when there's 20 or 50 other enterprises? Yes. So China, one example we learned from China, in China, just one enterprise that comes up with a product, the whole government and the whole country rallies behind that enterprise. So Sis Gladys will, 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 will share more information with you about, about that. And there's a whole lot of other products we're working on. And, and Jesse's question on, on the portal. Yes, there's a, a, a portal we're putting together because I mean, this is due really, this is long overdue. So we're working with the Department of Science and Innovation because at least they have scientists and engineers together with CSIR. In, in putting together a very comprehensive uh, database. And, and, and even here, but Andile, we want to encourage uh, all small businesses in the country to really be uh, part of that uh, database because that's where we want to understand the opportunities and challenges that confront uh, all the businesses. And the question on innovation uh, funding solutions, yeah. in fact, part of this policy dialogue is also to look at some of the research that is coming out of the BE Commission, the, the, the SMME funding policy, which is proposing a fund of funds. Yep. And I'm sure in the morning we learned uh, most corporates are hitting uh, in a, a target of, are, are achieving 65% of their target on ESD. So which, which gives us a sense that there are funds that are not spent yep. by corporates. So our proposal as government is, why are you not bringing those funds to the table so that exactly we can address these shortfalls we're addressing. Um, so, 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 so that's on the pipeline. And I'm hoping we can get feedback and support of the participants. Right. Here. And then lastly, the lady was running the Women Investment Conference. Yes. Definitely, I think all of us in this room would love to support um, that conference because as government, is we're in. really biased towards- He's in. <laughs> Uh, he's on. in i'm committing you right yes okay we're, we're in we're in we support you he's in great thank you all thank right you. ladies and gentlemen please give a round of applause to our panel thank you very much you guys we can uh, exit the stage it's lunchtime now people must eat you know yes there are gifts for you yes i, I keep forgetting this hotel thanks for reminding me we have gifts for you um let me start with the real guest mr mz thank you sir you must declare this thank you very much we see um I think it might be below the 1,000 rand mark. I don't know. I think you'll be okay. A round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. Just before I hand you over to lunch, I want to acknowledge the online audience that we have. I'm told that we've got a big contingent of other colleagues that could not be here physically with us in Santon that are joining us on our online platforms. And I just want to read out some of the questions and comments that came from them. Um, as you reflect over lunch, uh, shared online that said, we need to remove this red tape. You just went through, and I think she was referring um, to the red tape comment you were making, my lady, um, and realize that SMEs need to be given an opportunity to fail and learn from their mistakes. Sia Morris makes the comment, very interesting comment, I thought. What I am finding rather odd is that the business opportunities and challenges being highlighted by the panel is that they are not finding meaningful expression within the current new venture creation curriculum, which is endorsed by SACA and offered to SMMEs. This leads to knowledge gap and diminishes SMMEs competitiveness. For anybody that's been in an accredited program, you'd know about the new venture creation curriculum. It's a curriculum that's obviously um, um, regulated. Um, the question, the point he's making is that there's insights that are coming on stage that are not part of that curriculum which means I'm essentially being taught stuff that's outdated. It's not informed by what the real challenges are today. So maybe there's something to be had and a discussion to be had by our, our academics in the room. In fact, on that note, Barry, I met a gentleman called Barry from Regenesis. Please stand up, Barry, so they can see who you are. That gentleman there is Barry. He comes from Regenesis, the business school, and um, he would love to be involved in putting together a curriculum for the ESD community of practice and anybody that's keen to professionalize the comment that was made by Lita earlier on. So Barry, thank you for your help. Thank you for your support. So please, uh, with the team, please speak to Barry. Um, Martin is already standing up. Barry, that guy at the back there was as tall as you, was a bit bald from here. That's Martin. He's the guy who was bossing us around. So please chat to him so that you can help um, in putting together that program. 
Um, lots of other comments coming from everybody here. Joseph Ndaba from Mafikeng talking about digital innovation hubs. And he thinks that CEDA, uh, Bramzi, needs to be restructured to answer to the changing economy. He feels that the way we've set up this institution is still talking to what the economy used to be and not what it is today, which is a fair point, I guess. Ladies and gents, we have an hour to have lunch. It's 12.26. Let's pretend it's 12.30. I need you back here at 1.30. As I said, lunch is on level three. I'm looking at Odette, am I correct? Level three. That is where the dining room is. Please enjoy lunch. Please try to sit to next, next to somebody you don't know. Spark a conversation. Reflect on the morning session. And picking up at 1.30 from me will be Kitu Bezilikaba, our managing director, I'm an entrepreneur, and she'll be running with the rest of the program for the afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. Bon appétit.
Ladies and gents, good afternoon. I'm so glad we are not on graveyard shifts because I'm hearing laughter. People are happy. So I'm very glad we're not on graveyard shift after lunch. How delicious was that? Very good. As introduced earlier on by Andile Kumalo, my chairman, I am Kitume Tilekaba, the MD, and I'm an entrepreneur. And I will be taking you through the program this afternoon as well as tomorrow. Like he said, I am much prettier than him. Thank you. So this morning, we really had a jam-packed session, right? And, you know, what came out was that it's everybody's responsibility to make ESD work. It's not just the corporate it's not just the SMMEs, it's not just government, but it is a collaborative effort to make sure that we have ESD programs that are impactful and really effectively doing the transformation. The people at the back, the naughty corners at the back laughing, please settle down. We have started our section and also to our onliners, welcome back to the onliners um, that are still with us. We do recognize you and let me start that point again because the naughty corner at the back was distracting us. ESD is a collaborative effort. It is everybody's responsibility to make sure that ESD in the country works. It is government's responsibility, it is corporate's responsibility, and it is also the SMME's responsibility. And we are so glad to be having these conversations today, but you're not here to listen to me. I would like to introduce next on stage, our presenter, Mr. Gary Joseph. He is the technical assistant team at EDSE and he will introduce his panel members and also tell you more about unpacking the ESD community of practice. What is it and what's in it for the corporate practitioner? So please help me welcome Mr. Gary Joseph on stage. Thank you, Katya. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd, I'd first like just to thank all of the members of the team that has been operating in the background for the last three or four months to put together this event, as well as for all of the corporates, as well as the government officials that have been part of the process of building what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, two of the panelists that I have with me um, the first is Ms. Karnstein from MSD Merck, um, is part of the advisory committee that has been working in the background to provide guidance to us as the EDSE technical assistance team in, in collaboration with the Department of Small Business Development to put together what I'm going to be sharing with you today, the ESD community of practice. Also joining us on the stage is Mr. Bali. Bokako. Um, Billy is from CEDA. He's the lead for incubation. Um, and I've asked them to join me on the stage today in order to give inputs and to give some commentary around the work that we've been doing. So before, before I proceed to share my presentation with you, I'd just like uh, them to introduce themselves and to tell you a bit more about what they do and what their vision is and, and how they see the work of the community of practice uh, fitting into their world. Um, Karen? Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I've got laryngitis, so please excuse um, the roughness. Um, as Gary said, I'm Karen Stain. I'm the transformation lead at a company called MSD, um, which is part of Merck, a pharmaceutical company, and our head office is, is based in Chicago. Um, my role at MSD locally in South Africa is obviously ensuring that our company is compliant when it comes to triple BEE, but I've also been allocated the task of ensuring that I work directly and indirectly with our supplier diversity program, which we've launched about two or three years ago with the SASTC. And through this program, 
um, we've had about 15 um, SMMEs and QSEs um, on the program. And I think they, um, to my knowledge to date, haven't had any upsets yet. We've been advised that they've really been doing exceptional work um, and gaining the knowledge that they, they needed that was lacking in their business. So that in a nutshell is, is what I do um, at MSD. And I also work very closely through this program. I work very closely with our regional team as well as, as the headquarters. Primarily multinationals um, in South Africa, our revenue is so small um, that we need to be begging for money all the time to support local programs. But fortunately, in our instance, we've proven to our powers that be up the line how critical um, enterprise and supply development is within our economy and what value um, these EMEs and QSEs brings to, not just to our business, but to the economy overall. And through that program, we are under the spotlight and we continuously wanting to improve our interactions with both government and private sector. And obviously with national health insurance coming through, it's a, it's a, it's a biggie for us in the pharmaceutical industry and, it's, and we need to be ready for that. But we don't want to be ready with the big giants. We want to be ready with the small um, companies as they are known by growing them into the giants that we are currently exposed to and trying to correct um, the, that, the, the legacy issues that we were uh, given. Um, so working with the SASTC as well as um, the ESD community, you know, the, the, the purpose for us from a private sector perspective is that we're able to collaborate and share ideas because this is a lonely space. If anyone is in the transformation space, they'll understand that statement that I've just made. Um, and by having these sort of relationships and partnerships does make the job easier, not just for us as change agents, as we know, but also for the SMMEs and QSEs out there in the market space by allowing them to be able to understand what the challenges is that we, we are faced with at corporate and how we can best assist them through the initiatives that are, uh, um, we'll obviously go into more detail about. So with that being said, um, thank you for, for giving us this opportunity, Carrie, and I look forward to engaging further with everyone. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carrie, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Billy Bukako. I am the senior manager responsible for incubation at CEDA. Um, we have the tough role or task of coordinating market access, amongst other things, for over 2,500 SMMEs across the country as part of our incubation program. And we have seen, you know, with certain instances, for instance, if you look at incubators like Sanami, who are in the Eastern Cape, who are supplying uh, vegetables to spas boxes throughout the whole of Mount Frey, Mount Elif, Kwapata, you know, such a big project. And we've seen, you know, good examples with, uh, if you look at the tier two suppliers to Ford and some of the automotive, um, 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 you know, manufacturers um, through the AIDC um, 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 incubator. But then you look at other incubators that sit in the room not understanding you know, where the supply chain starts and ends and where they can get a sweet spot in a rendezvous and how we perceive the comment of practice to be. It is that rendezvous where the practitioners and the beneficiaries get to, you know, get a meeting spot and we can share best practices, we can share learning. So this is quite exciting for us and we look forward to seeing it come to fruition. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Billy and Karen. So let me continue then um, to introduce you and unpack for you what the enterprise and supply development community of practice is all about. Um, is this on? There we go. Okay, research that has been commissioned through uh, the enterprise, um, the, the ecosystem development for small enterprises funded by the European Union and all of my colleagues that are in the room have, were instrumental in putting together um, 
the processes leading up to the outcome of that research. In February 2022, the surveys and research conducted um, identified a number of gaps. Um, firstly, when it came to the whole issue of uh, um, confidence that enterprise and supply development is delivering impact, it was determined that there was a very low level of confidence associated with that. When they looked at the whole issue of access to market, because if we have a look at enterprise and supply development, it's linked to preferential procurement and the development of capacity where the, the codes are very specific around encouraging companies to link enterprise development activities to their value chains in order to ensure that access to market is the intended outcome. And this was very low confidence in it delivering impact, but also that access to market in most cases did not materialize. And we all know that there are three key areas of challenge for small businesses, let alone black businesses. Those are access to skills, and there's a lot of that ha that's happening. Um, access to finance and the difficulty of accessing finance is linked to the last one, which is access to market. So it was recognized at that stage. And key to it is the lack of information and the lack of programs that results in an environment where entry and red tape is removed in order to render those markets accessible. The key findings in the report demonstrated that there was a great variety of, of, of uh, approaches and differences to the way in which corporates and large buying entities that implement enterprise and supply development as part of their scorecard, what they were doing within the marketplace. It was also clear that there was virtually uh, no collaboration taking place amongst buying firms and companies within that space. Um, most of it was driven with the objective of ticking the box and achieving the compliance objectives with very little, if any, forms of monitoring and evaluation to measure impact. And the impact that we are looking for comes back to what was mentioned earlier by one of our speakers, the three plights of our country, unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And monitoring and evaluation was clearly absent within that space, um, besides the measurement criteria under the codes of good practice. And then uh, in addition to that, there was a recognition that enterprise and supply development is relevant, but it has to be driven as a long-term uh, strategy in order to deliver on the impact. But unfortunately, the approaches that were picked up from the research were short term in relation to delivering on that impact. There wasn't also any form of aggregated uh, um, national measurement that, could do, uh, that was taking place around the impact of enterprise and supplier development. And as a result of, of, of that research, um, the need for an enterprise and supply development uh, community of practice was identified. So why develop the enterprise and, and, and um, supply development community of practice? The first thing is to create this platform through which enterprise and supply development practitioners, ESD practitioners are able to share experiences the good and the bad, learn from each other, and look at ways in which they are better able to collaborate within the space of enterprise and supply development to deliver the forms of impact that the codes of good practice had intended to deliver. Since ESD is currently measured at the company level, the community of practice was, is viewed as a way in which we are able to aggregate at a company level, at a uh, buying firm level, the outcomes and the outputs associated with those, uh, those um, interventions. Um, and can, through cascading it together or bringing it together, we are able to have a much better view of what the impact is through the practices that are taking place within that community. Then there's the need for sharing resources, different practices, um, and even within the resource space, 
um, there's a lot of duplication of effort that is happening within the marketplace. So how do you avoid that? Best through engagement and communication. Instead, we, we heard earlier about one of the challenges that companies find themselves on multiple ESD programs. And I know that with many businesses entering these programs, they do so with the hope of accessing more market opportunity. The objective being that if, if you're investing in me, your return on investment is by buying more from me, or if you're not buying from me, to start buying from me. And unfortunately, with companies going through over all of these different programs, there's a capacity building fatigue that's starting to set in with these businesses. So how do you avoid that happening by rather complementing what you do where, and providing fit for purpose training interventions, but that can only happen if you have an environment where you're able to collaborate. And then around the industry itself, developing the skills. There isn't a specific program or professional standard associated with being an enterprise and supply development practitioner. In other industries, you find that. So how do you actually create a platform through which you are able to adopting the FUBU approach, for us, by us approach, develop a industry standard and a professional skills development um, and, and career path for enterprise and supply development practitioners in order to professionalize it. And through this professionalization, you are creating much stronger capacity and a knowledge base within that environment. So the, the enterprise and supply development community of practice has been work in the, in, in, in the making since last year. And a lot of the work that has happened is focused on addressing exactly what has been identified as the need for such a community of practice. But before I continue with what the ESD community of practice is, I want to share with you what a community of practice is all about, any community of practice, and how the enterprise and supply development community of practice relates to that. So firstly, this is a collaborative initiative between public and private sector. It is not private sector doing it on its own. It's not public sector doing it on, on its own. It is the recognition on the part of players within this SMME development space, players within the transformation space, both public and private sector, that are saying, besides the policy environment at a practical level, there's a need for us to work together and to look at how we can drive better impact and to increase the trajectory of transformation, leveraging enterprise and supply development. So it, it is aimed at improving enterprise and supply development outcomes, as well as the impact associated with it. And it is a means through which um, better awareness can be created as a collective around the good work that is going within that space. It, it's a mechanism through which um, knowledge sharing can take place. And it's a mechanism through which professional development can happen. Um, and at the, um, on the overall, the improvement of practitioner skills in order to support the day-to-day -day work that they do. The nice thing about the work that we do within that this space is that it is driven by the power of passion. Everybody that has spoken on the stage so far and others that you would be hearing from have a strong passion for what they do. And from a community of practice perspective, that's the passion that will power the community of practice going forward. So what is a community of practice? It's actually a group of people coming together with a common objective to, to focus on how through the, the, the engagements that take place between themselves, they can share knowledge practices and share problems and find common solutions um, to those problems um, in um, 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 the most flexible means possible. The ESD community of practice itself is a joint initiative, like I mentioned, between the public and private sector. And um, it has been formed um, due to the lack of pronounced inf um, information exchange and best practice sharing within the ESD space to close that vacuum. 
and to create this platform through which knowledge sharing, um, training and development for professional skills, and, and an overall better framework for ESD implementation under Triple B E can take place as an effort, joint effort between the public and private sector. Every community of practice has three characteristics associated with it. It has a domain, um, which is what the topic is that is being shared and the, the area of interest. Any community of practice also defines who belongs to that community. And then second, um, lastly, what the practice is that is under discussion. When we look at the enterprise and supply development community of practice, um, the domain is, uh, is, or what the in common interest is, is to support enterprise and supply development efforts um, to deliver meaningful economic impact and empowerment outcomes. And then the community itself is made up of enterprise and supply development practitioners who come from private and public sector who are responsible for driving enterprise and supply development strategy, implementation and outcomes as part of their day-to-day -day, um, job function and part of their overall career. And then the practice is enterprise and supply development as we are familiar with it under the codes of good practice, but also in terms of developing suppliers into, in your supply chain, developing enterprises in order to create jobs um, and creating a more competitive market economy in the country. Any community of practice has a why behind it. And those are many of the characteristics associated with it. It's about learning, it's spontaneous and that's why it needs to be flexible. Um, it's about sharing problems. It's about mutual engagement. Um, and it, uh, connecting, um, but also innovation. Many problems are best solved when a diverse set of views are brought together to drive um, different solutions that may not exist out there. So through the communities of practice, you are able to get innovation. And the community of practice uh, for um, enterprise and supply development is what we see being um, set up, is, has been set up and will be operating in order to address all of those characteristics in terms of the why. So who is the community of practice? Um, any community of practice has a basic structure linked to it. You've got to have a core set of people operating within the center that drives the, the vision, the mission, and the shared objectives of that community of practice. And then you have members within the community of practice who participate within its activities and contribute jointly to the common objective that it has. And then there is um, the outer circle where you have um, interested and affected parties. The way in which we've um, configured thus far the, um, the community of practice is that at the moment, um, the um, EDSE um, technical assistance team, myself, the likes of Martin, Odette, um, um, Dr. Mzi, um, are all part of a technical assistance team that is sitting and working on a day-to-day -day basis to support getting the community of practice up and running and um, coordinating its activities. We have part of guiding and directing the work that we do. We have an advisory committee that has been set up. This advisory committee is made up of representatives from both the public and private sector, five representatives from either um, parties. And through the advisory committee, we have set up working groups that will start functioning to focus on specific areas of interest that have been identified as priorities. And then, of course, we've got the outer circle of interested and affected parties, which is the entire um, community of practice uh, membership, which we um, are hoping will be growing at an accelerated rate after today's session. In order for a community of practice to function, critical to it is having buy-in. And at this stage, this community of practice 
um, and, and the discussions and everything that has been happening in the background has been escalated. And we are in the process of securing cabinet support for the work that we will be doing going forward. When we look at the how, every community of practice has a number of things that it does. Um, and those would include facilitation of um, knowledge sharing platforms, etc. So when we have a look at the community of practice, uh, specifically on with our focus on ESD, amongst other things that we will be doing is creating these platforms and activities that will foster best practice implementation within the enterprise and supply development um, arena, as well as research being conducted within that space. Um, we will be um, undertaking capacity building and training interventions in order to upskill um, enterprise and supply development uh, or ESD practitioners within that, that that are part of the membership of the organization. Um, through the upskilling of them, they are able to better perform within the jobs that they, they fulfill on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they will all, we will also be facilitating workshops on topical issues. Last week, we had a workshop on the Triple B e Commission report on the ESD implementation. And it was a very interesting conversation that took place there with a panel and a presentation from the Triple B e Commission of the findings of that report, um, which also substantiated what was it, um, uh, presented earlier in terms of the Sunlam um, Gage report. Um, these type of webinars um, and, and um, knowledge sharing sessions will be part of a repository of, of, of knowledge that we will be building up over time that can be accessed by practitioners as part of their professional development and also part of their learning around um, what they need to know to be effective at what they do. Um, this, this knowledge repository that I mentioned will be in an online environment and already with funding that has been made available through the EU, there are um, e-learning um, uh, e learning uh, products developed that we will be rolling out to the members of the community of practice. Um, there's also research being, uh, being conducted further around the enterprise and supply development element of the Sunlam Gage report, taking it to the next level. You would have picked up from the report that um, enterprise ESD, that um, all of the points were, 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 were um, clustered together. Um, what we wanna look at is individually within all of the areas, what are the, the challenges and what is the data telling us from um, the data available to Sunlam Gage of what's happening within the ESD space. So that from a, um, a a, a community of practice perspective, we have a better understanding of what needs to be done to address the shortcomings and as a collective. And then we also want to recognize through case study um, that, that would be documented and um, other forms of recognition, the good work that was happening within the space of enterprise and supply development by the practitioners that on a day-to-day -day basis are doing this work. The benefits, um, Every community of practice drives a set of benefits to its members in order to keep them engaged. For us, um, sorry, am I going backwards? <laughs> um, we want to be able to move the discipline from pockets of excellence to a holistic um, industry of excellence that is driven as a professional body, um, a profession within this environment. The more professionalized the environment becomes, the more skilled and knowledgeable the practitioners are, the more effective the outcomes of programs would be and the greater the impact um, they are. So this allowance of sharing that can take place through the community of practice are some of the smaller steps um, leading up to this whole long-term vision of professionalizing the industry itself. Our key priorities is to continue with the rollout of our activity roadmap, which I will share in the next slide. Our working groups need to commence with its operations. 
um, and, and its focus areas amongst which is this, um, how do we drive the sustainability of the community of practice itself? What are the products and, the, and, and offerings that needs to be bedded down um, and, and driven as demand support services um, and, and initiatives under the community of practice? We've got to um, develop and sign off on an operating model to sustain this initiative going forward, um, because at the moment, um, the support is coming from the inter, um, Ecosystems Development for Small Enterprises program um, uh, funded by the EU, um, which comes to an end um, in the next uh, couple of months. So how do we continue to, to build on the momentum that we've put in place before? And how do we provide, and, and then there will be inputs and, and, and direction um, that will be provided by the advisory committee to sign off on the sustainability pro pro program. And today is one of the steps around promoting and advocating to ESD practitioners that may be in the room or online to become part of this community and to, to, to become part of the, the power um, and the passion that would be driving um, the practice going forward. Just some of the activities already during the month of May, we've had a number of, tech, of formal activities taking place. Up until the end of, of October, we have other activities planned. There are some workshops, um, there are some webinars, um, topical webinars, um, that we've put onto the radar that we will be driving. I, I'm, I'm sure everybody's quite keen to engage in debate around the, uh, the procurement bill and the implications thereof. Um, sometimes our private sector um, practitioners are not part of that dialogue yet. The companies participate within the public procurement space. So understanding this new bill is an important part of the practitioner's landscape. Um, that's amongst the one of them. And then also with um, working along with CEDA, um, having a masterclass on um, CEDA's um, revised uh, supply development program on how corporate uh, practitioners are able to collaborate with CEDA in that space. So these are some of the topics we will be covering and the Enterprise and Supply Development Community of Practice Advisory Committee will be meeting at least every second month in order to drive forward um, the sustainability objectives and the strategic direction of the community of practice. So if you are an ASD practitioner online in the room and you're keen to become part of this movement that we've, we've started building, you're most welcome to contact us uh, using the contact details over there. Um, you can send an email for more information to secretariat at esdcommunity.net or our website will be launched after uh, this conference and you are able to go via the website and become a member online. Of course, membership the decision around membership would be based upon whether you qualify as an applicant to be a member um, and, and the decision would vest at the end of the day with the advisory committee, but we're encouraging everybody um, who plays within the space of ESD as, as a practitioner to a corporate, to a state-owned entity to please become part of this movement. Um, so before I ask any questions from the audience, I'm going to just go back to um, Karen and to Billy, just to get their inputs on what they think, uh, the community of practice, um, what I've shared already, how it would be supporting what they're doing. And if there's anything else that they would like to add, because that's what the community of practice is all about. It, it gets driven by the needs and the interest of the participants within the community. Karen? Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, so for us at MSD, it's important that we always aligned and that we, um, you know, what's happening out in the industry. As I said earlier, this space is quite lonely. Um, if you have a PE certificate out there, that certificate becomes competitive and it's everybody's knowledge. And, you know, um, if, if you're in, a, in, in an environment where you're sitting with your competitive competitors, you don't want to really discuss the programs. Well, I've got news for you because this space is where we're going to need to collaborate with each other. 
Um, through my experience, and I've been in the transformation space since 20, uh, 2007, across different sectors. And in the space, I have found that a lot of money is being thrown at the problem, but the problems are not going away. They're just getting bigger. And I think through partnership um, with the community of, 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 of practice um, will give each and every one of us, like it has done for, for, for um, MSD, an opportunity to collaborate with our competitors when it comes to our suppliers. Because the key thing here is, is that suppliers are the ones, they are the beneficiaries of what we as practitioners um, would enable them to grow from one level to the next level. At the moment, we're working in isolation. We always wanting to have, you know, um, that good certificate out there. But what is the impact? What is sustainability behind that scorecard? Um, because our suppliers are really a critical factor in what we do around transformation and changing the landscape of the economy of this country. If we don't start partnering, collaborating, sharing knowledge, platforms like uh, what Carrie has just presented, we're going to forever go around the same table, talking the same story, and that mountain is just going to get bigger and bigger, and no one is going to be able to succeed in trying to make a difference in the beneficiaries' lives. And I think from a corporate perspective, working with government, by sharing this knowledge, we understand exactly where government is, because we're all sitting back and saying this is government's problem. No, it's not. It's every single one of our problem. If we want to create the next ESVs, the next Bidvest, the next whatever big companies out there, it starts with us as change agents in the little bit of effort, um, with a little bit of monies that we have, 5% uh, of our net profit after tax in comparison to what we're actually spending in real time with those big organizations is a drop in the ocean. So I'm going to encourage every single person, MSD will be a member of the community because we do see the value thereof. And I do believe, thank you, and I do believe, so, and I do believe platforms like this will we should be encouraging each other, whether you're in the same sector, whether you're in a different sector. Take the opportunity, the learnings that I've taken out of the few meetings that we've had, joining um, you know, the community and understanding what their vision is. It's very clear. It's aligned to our mission. As transformation agents, we have our own mission in life, and there is aligned to mine. So I do want to make a difference. I'm encouraging every single corporate member, every single SMME, and every single government official be a part of this organization. The knowledge sharing is amazing. I've walked away knowing exactly how, what, how, when, and when to execute and what that outcome is going to look like. So thank you so much. Thank you, Corinne. Before, Billy, before I come to you, quite an interesting thing is that um, Busi over there and Corinne over here are part of our advisory committee. And actually, today is the first time that they met in person. Otherwise, they've only been seeing each other as acronyms on the screen during our meetings and only hearing each other's voices. So this is, this is one of the first steps as well around the community of practice, getting people to have a face-to-face -face engagement and to start discussing things that are relevant to them, just creating that platform. Billy? Um, thanks, Gary. Uh, I think on that note, uh, I was actually quite excited earlier on to see some of the colleagues that I sit in different meetings with, um, such as Maud, uh, Mr. Memani, and all of them. So the work has already started. And what you all is talking about is collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration. And I just want to maybe touch on a few activities that we are undertaking as CEDA um, that we, we hope will anchor you know, this community of practice. And we've just, uh, we are in um, a procurement process of um, three aspects uh, that we hope are going to support the community of practice. Um, the first one is e-learning platforms. Um, which is basically a mechanism that we're hoping will promote the knowledge sharing, uh, best practices and capacity building for the practitioners. Um, linked to that is a masterclass series. I think it's been part of um, your calendar for the rest of this year. We're doing a, a procurement process for you know, masterclasses that will become part of that community of practice to, to, to empower you know, both practitioners 
and, and beneficiaries. And looking around the room, I'm sure we're gonna be knocking in a lot of doors to be part of you know, those masterclasses. And the last one is the district information management system which we are hoping will be a cloud-based um, um, you know, um, platform um, that will facilitate the district ecosystem um, for this uh, community of practice, um, just to support that collaboration between the ecosystem players. So all of those things, we're hoping that will anchor this and we look forward to be having you as part of um, the community of practice. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Um, so, um, oh. We do have a couple of minutes left. Okay, do we? Um, are there any questions or comments from the floor uh, before we move on to our next item on the agenda? We've got someone at the back over there, Ayanda. Um, yeah, there's a mic coming. Hi everyone, I am Ayanda Mzondeki and I'm the founder and CEO of Liema Consulting. So as a proud beneficiary of the SASDC and all the work that they do, I just have a question for Karen over and above my comment of saying, keep up the good work, it's amazing work. And we are a vision or proof of the work that you do. So Karen, if you can maybe advise some of us in the room or some of the corporates in the room as to what are the key learnings from your journey through what you have been doing um, for all these years and just some tips um, from a human centered point of view because I personally know that you care about us entrepreneurs. Thank you, Ayanda. Um, before we get, Karen, I'm gonna park that one for okay. you, right? Um, Thanks, and that's, that's part of the objective of the community of practice. People like Karen being able to share with other practitioners her journey and what she's learned. And, and through that, strengthen um, the career pathing of the, and choices that others would be able to make. Are there any other questions or comments in the room? Sorry, one more at the back, there we go. Thanks. My name is Mpo Tseole from Rustenbeck. Um, I run an innovative financing uh, company for small business and an incubator. Uh, my question, maybe I did not see the slide clearly. Uh, the community of practice uh, members are ESD practitioners within corporates. Is there a consideration to involve uh, those who run ESD programs outside of those corporates, maybe as service providers, um, to enhance the discussions and the best practice uh, in terms of ESD. Thanks. I, I think I'll respond to that one. Um, can I take a third question if there is? Here we go. Um, afternoon, everyone. My name is Terence. I'm from BS Vision. Um, so basically, in my past life, I used to be a consultant, and I think uh, be a consultant. Part of my frustration was uh, there was no collaborated effort in our firm to either solve clients' problems. So I've got 10 companies I work on. I develop an ESD solution for them, SED or skills or whatever but it's not connected. And I posed the question, one of the question was, if we were to tackle the education sector, I mean, we are a group of people here, we can source these funds, solve a problem and then, and then move to the next sector. I think I just wanna applaud you guys for having managed to set up something similar like this. I hope it can, uh, in my narrow mind where I am, I'm thinking at least if you can sort of tackle certain sectors as you grow. Uh, for example, Brima was a, great success story. If we need businesses within the logistics, you focus on that and so forth. Um, I think in addition to, so that was just a comment, but uh, I just wanted to sort of add to the question that was posed now. When you look at the setup, uh, the structure of the industry, uh, you've got verification analysts who are not really skilled to assess the impact that has been made. So it's more of 
give me these documents. Have you done it? That's it. So ESD practitioners are left isolated with their solutions, whether they are sustainable or they've got impact, it's, 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 it's something they do on their own. So in essence, I think I'm adding to say, is there going to be an effort to sort of open it up to uh, consultants or these verification analysts so that it's sort of interconnected and every stakeholder can be able to sort of participate and contribute meaningfully? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm going to ask Karen just to respond to Ayanda's question, and then I'll at attempt to, uh, to, to answer the question from the two gentlemen. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Ayanda. So I think for me, you know, being in the space, the one thing that transformation agents or transformation managers need, you need to have passion. Because if you don't have the passion, because as black people or as black women especially, we come from an era where we were told what to do and how to do. And now you're stepping into the corporate world and you've been handed the scorecard and you need to now understand where does this organization want to go to. Once you understand all of that, your passion starts coming through. My passion is people. My passion is my suppliers. And my passion is to ensure that they get from one state to the next state. And so, Ayanda, in all of what I do, I do it up front. I'm very, very transparent. I don't hide anything and I keep nothing out of the boardroom. Uh, my MD can witness to that. I have issues. If I have an issue with whether it be a supplier or internal matters that needs to be taken care of, the end goal is to resolve it in a manner that both entities are not left out in the cold. Um, and once you understand what your role is within an organization, you journey along with your suppliers. You can move from company to company, take your suppliers along with you because you are the one that have built those relationships with those suppliers. If they are able to deliver and obviously sustain what you have instilled and, 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 and given to them. By doing that, you're actually creating market access into some other entities or sectors. So always remain focused, go with passion and be transparent. Don't for one minute think you get paid by your organization. These backhand stories don't work guys, it's not sustainable. Um, our small business, our, our QSEs, our EMEs cannot afford to be paying any transformation agent or procurement practitioner just to get access into your organizations. They are able to deliver on product and services because that's why they created and took the opportunity to create their own companies. We are being paid by our global companies to execute on mandates handed down to us. And let us do that. And through those, and if you are really honest in terms of what you are supposed to be doing in terms of your mandate, you'll do it to the best of your ability, taking your supplies along the way. So that's in a nutshell what I've always done. Um, where I'm at at the moment, I've brought many organizations through my journey with me, and some of them are really getting into the medium spaces coming out of being very, very small companies. Um, and I'm happy to say that um, we have done this in a, I have tried to do it in a sustainable manner. Obviously, the triple BE codes has given us the opportunity to go back and reflect where to improve and where not um, to touch, where you're not supposed to be touching. The QSE and EME space, still a very big um, area where there's a lot of corruption that could take place. So do yourself a favor, also get your certifications done through the various organizations that are out there um, so that when you are doing your company's annual BE certif uh, certification, you know you are working with EMEs and QSEs that are authentic and that are who they say they are on black and white, regardless of what sector they're sitting in. Because trust me, you can tickle down and find exactly who those 51% shareholders are. Um, and, and, and if you don't have that in place, you're really going to be shooting yourself in the foot. So working with the community of, of, of practice, I think, again, I'm going to encourage everyone to take the opportunity, make it work for yourself as individuals and for your organization that you're representing. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> so when we were busy 
um, crafting what the community of practice should look like and who the members need to be. A key aspect of the thinking was around how do we unlock the bond, which is the market access, the resources, um, which are the ESD budgets, um, in a way that drives the impact as a priority. So the community of practice membership, um, it was deemed necessary to focus on the practitioners who play that role, that point of intersection between um, corporates, the budgets and the market access opportunities and the intended beneficiaries of ESD uh, uh, programs, um, black owned EMEs and QSEs. It made sense to start there. It's not to say that the ESD community of practice will remain there, but for now, it, it's the key focus. Within the confines of a community of practice, you're able to establish um, through the flexibility of the community of practice interest groups. And part of the discussions that have already been taking place uh, through the advisory committee is how um, engagement with ESD consultants um, and um, implementation agents, how can that be facilitated because they are an important part of the ecosystem and have a voice that can provide direction and add value to the work that the community of practice will be doing. So watch that space, it will be coming, um, but we need to ensure that we have focus in order to drive the main objective of ESD delivering impact and growth and prosperous black businesses within um, corporate supply chains and the benefit of that in government supply chains as well. So with that, I'd like to thank Karen. I'd like to thank Billy. I've got gifts for you. Um, and thank you all for um, listening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our speakers as well as Gary. It's quite exciting, right, to move conversation from spend to impact. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs and for a lot of SMMEs, they're waiting and can't wait for the day that they're only going to one ESD program that's applicable to their need. They get the impact that's required and they continue on as a sustainable business. So that is really something to look forward to. And I think in this community of practice, from me personally, I really look forward to the work and the impact that's going to come out of it because conversations are nice but we want to see the work that comes from the conversation. So I think to everybody that is part of the community of practice, including myself and the team, Boosie and everybody, Martin and Odette, we're going to hold you guys accountable. One year later, we can't be having the same conversations. Something must have moved, but we're very certain that it certainly will with the, pre with the people, with the organizations and the support that is sitting in the room and the people that are outside also supporting community of practice, I have no doubt that the needle is definitely going to shift. But with that said, let's now hear from ESD practitioners themselves. We are going to go into our last panel for today. Um, our panel is going to be headed up by Ms. Ndogozo Majola. Ms. Ndogozo Majola is the Executive Manager, Enterprise and Supply Development at CEDA, and she will introduce the practitioners that are going to speak about shaping a practitioner-centered community of practice. What are the challenges, but beyond the challenges, what are the opportunities that we see going forward? And how can we really move that conversation from spend to proper SMME impact? So please help me to welcome, give Ms. Ndogozo Majola, a huge round of applause as she comes on stage to introduce her guests. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm quite cognizant of the fact that this is our last session uh, for today. And um, I'm blocking you from going home. Uh, but I promise you um, that we'll save the best for the last. Um, our very 
powerful panel will definitely um, keep you interested. Uh, so I'm going to call each one of them up to come to the podium. The theme of this um, session is um, shaping a practitioner-centered community of practice. What are the challenges and opportunities from a practitioner uh, point of view? I think um, one of the last two questions in the, in the last session was really about the, the, the role of, of the ESD practitioner. So I'm going to request my panel members to come and, and join me at the front. I'm going to start with um, Temba Palangangwe, uh, who is a GM, Governance and Transformation at the South African Insurance Association. The next one will be Dr. Lusa Pongjenge, who is a manager for ESD at Exaro Resources. Followed by Mark Frankel, who is the CEO at Black Umbrellas. And the last one is uh, Matebe. Zombo, CEO Akalitika. Thank you. I think before I start with my uh, questions, um, or maybe let me pose a question. We, we saw Lerato's presentation uh, earlier uh, when she was taking us through. When she was taking us, taking us through the, the gauge um, the report, um, ESD was one of the least performing uh, elements of the BE uh, scorecard, um, especially, you know, uh, let me say across the board, except SOEs. And I think that that is one of the elements that can make um, a very big contribution to economic development generally and in tackling uh, the, the, the three, you know, um, elements of uh, poverty, inequality and unemployment um, in the country. From a practitioner point of view, uh, what do you think are some of the challenges? So you can just briefly introduce yourself and then give us your perspective. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Temba Palahangwe and I'm the general manager for governance and transformation at SAIA, the South African Insurance Association. Okay, I think yeah, for me, just challenges and, and opportunities and, and you know, uh, in moments like this, I, I tend to be an academic and just try to firstly check what are we talking about? And, and for the purpose of the, the session, I just made it simple and just look at the definitions. You know, we speak about transformation. And I think if you go and Google what transformation means, it leaves you with a very short string, <laughs> you know, to, to, to work with. And, and, and pretty much nothing comes out of it, you know, if you look at it. If you look at the, we move into development. What does development is a process of change, full stop. The dictionary or Wikipedia or wherever you go is so clear. And that's the crux of the problem. <laughs> that's the crux of the problem. So looking at it, we should be talking about inclusion. We should be talking about inclusion because inclusion speaks to access. 
and, 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 and for me, so opportunities in the sense really looks into two things. Perspective, which is an attitude towards something and our attitudes are different, you know. We have the shortcut, you know, compliance, whatever you call it. We've been in the space, we know the practice and, and we know what does perspective means to us. And that is generally followed by intention, which is the plan about your perspective. And, and different companies have different attitudes. So I'm rounding it off. I'm saying opportunities and challenges for us sits in really our perspective about the, the problem statement and therefore our intention about resolving it. Thank you. Uh, Lusapo, as a, as a practitioner, uh, do you see value in the COP um, addressing some of the challenges that are, uh, practitioners are dealing with in the ESG space? Okay. Um, thanks, Togos, and uh, thanks once again for inviting me here. Please I get to wear a jacket. I work in a mining company, so I don't know if my jacket still fits me. I'll also try and be philosophical like my colleague here. So there's this book I'm reading by Todd Rose called um, Collective Illusions. So Collective Illusions is um, a good example. Remember that story about the emperor is naked. So this emperor, um, two con men come and see the emperor. They convince him that they're, they're gonna make him the best garment, but only smart people be able to see what he's wearing. So they basically thread air. The guy's naked. They thread air, but they tell him that the only people that will see that you are dressed are people who are smart. So the emperor walks around the street and everybody, because we all want to be smart, no one says this guy's naked. They all pretend as if the guy's wearing clothes until a kid says, but this guy's naked. So I think here we've got two um, collective illusions where the guys in the private, in the public sector, I mean, I used to work there for years. We think the private sector doesn't know ESD, they're doing it as a tick box exercise. And these guys have got 26 billion, they don't know what they're doing. The private sector feels government who's controlling 2.6 billion according, which is 10% 10, 10 of what the private sector is controlling. They are very agile, they're not agile, their policies are outdated. So we've got these two communities that have convinced each other that we both don't know what we're doing, you know. And I think a platform like the Committee of Practice becomes that child that pulls us together and says, guys, let's sit down and collaborate. So I think to me, it's, it's, it's a good platform in that it gets both sides of the table to sit together and say, what are the messy problems that face both of us and how do we go about and resolve those? So I think there's, there's great value. No one can implement ESD in isolation. No one has done that. Even CEDA doesn't work in isolation. So I think the more you pull people together, you can really understand what the problems are and then create appropriate solutions in that space. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, your perspective? On the challenges and opportunities. Um, I think the opportunity uh, with the community of practice um, for practitioners is around um, the real intentions, I suppose, behind the work that needs to be done. Because what we find in the work that we do is the right intention is there, you'll find a solution to the problem when the intention is not there, when it's to spend as little as possible to achieve the points on the scorecard, then there's very little impact that's created, obviously. So it's to really share the learnings and the experiences, I think, which can help educate um, people within corporates who, who are responsible for those areas, how the work should be done and the impact that can be achieved. So to share the learnings, to share the lessons, um, I think that's a massive opportunity because it is a very complex area and it's been spoken about today to a large extent. You're trying to marry supply chain and procurement and development work and they live in different worlds. I mean, part of the work that we do in getting businesses to be procurement ready is just to get an understanding of supply chain. It's a different language that's spoken. It's got different metrics that drive it. How do you understand what a buyer um, is looking for um, and to be able to talk the same language as them and deliver on what they need. So I think 
that's also part of the education process is how do we make people within corporates and within government to a certain extent aware of the world of the small business and where they're coming from and the support that they needed. I mean, it was very encouraging this morning and the work that ShopRite is doing and having a dedicated unit, you know, to be able to support uh, the onboarding of uh, new small suppliers within uh, the supply chain. So I think, sorry, I am rambling on and on a bit, but I think that's the real value that can be shared. I think the challenges are, um, you know, to a certain extent amongst our practitioners is to see how we can collaborate, <laughs> you know, in the space, because we, uh, they were saying earlier that there shouldn't be competition when it comes to development work, but there is still a lot of it happening in the space. But I think what's a real opportunity is that everybody has their space in the value chain. So I know everybody's scrambling to find businesses which are procurement ready, which are funding ready, but somehow the businesses need to get there to be able to get to that level. And that development work needs to happen. And it's not as you know, sexy, it doesn't talk to the scorecard as much in terms of preferential procurement, et cetera, but we have to do the work that's needed to build that pipeline so those businesses can be ready for those opportunities. And when they are, who can then next take them on, you know, to the next level that they need to go to? And then who can take them on from there, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's immense opportunity to find um, the value within the ecosystem, uh, within the space, and to be able to make that known. People understand that better, talk to each other, work together better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, coming to you. Coming to you, uh, Matebe, and I would like to you to start by introducing yourself. You've been uh, on the SOE side, and now you are on the uh, private sector side. Um, I think there is shared or common interest amongst uh, ESD practitioners, both in the public and, and private sector. Uh, perhaps the interests are different, um, maybe I dare say, uh, one with more, I think, focus on impacts and, and transformation, but also from, I think, from the private side or consultant side, if I may use that word, um, there is also, um, I mean, personal um, interest. What value do you see the 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 COP uh, bringing in the ESD practitioner space? Hmm. Thank you so very much. Um, yes, you're right. I've done a a bit of work in the telecom, edcon, and now I'm also on the hustling side. Um, but I think what is important is, is what my panelists have already um, spoken about. And I think about um, Mozambique's first uh, president, uh, Samara Michel, uh, when he was uh, rallying up, you know, the, the community and rallying up um, the armed forces. And he used to say, Aluta, continua, and the, the crowds would shout back, Aluta, continua, and, and he would go on again. And everybody was really pumped up. And then he would say, against what? Mm. And then he would look at them and say, what, what does the fight continue against what? And I think that for me is critical um, in this space because we are talking about ESD. Um, I met, I mean, I was listening here this morning about somebody kept on saying, you know, you need the right skills to fight and you need these skills to fight, but what exactly are we fighting against? And I think that's what's important um, for us, all of us to understand, whether it's in the public sector, whether it's in the private sector, whether, you know, in people in this room. And when you look at, obviously, the painful past that South Africa comes from, um, we look at how we are basically the highest Gini coefficient um, country in the world. And we think about economics and we think about um, equity in economics. You know, um, ESD and triple B, in fact, is a legislation tool to be able to help us to achieve equity. And I think, therefore, if we can crystallize that and get to the point of then what does impact really mean, 
then we have some sort of strategic positioning and not only st strategic positioning, but we also have um, then a way to approach it and a way to then create value and be able to show value in all, in all sides. And I think a space like this would be able to get us to that point and allow us to unpack even some of the complexities in the policy. I mean, one that I, um, I used to really enjoy a lot is being able to graduate ED to SD, you know, on an annual basis. And you're thinking, but how does that work when it takes, when in three years time, within three years, 90% of startups fail, right? How, would, how does that work? How am I able to start an ESD program today and then graduate them tomorrow? Um, and then uh, somebody here this morning spoke about the 14 year old startup. It's true. Most of the businesses actually grow and create value after 10 years. So I think those are some of the things we need to grapple with to understand in both in policy grounding, but in actual and in implementation and skills and so on and strategy, what are we actually trying to achieve? And I think ultimately, once we all do that, we then are able to advocate for the strategic positioning, both in private sector and in public sector. Okay. I think one of the things that we, we did previously as CEDA, but mostly in the incubation space, Again, out of realization that there were, was uh, no standardization in the both in the establishment, but mostly um, in running um, incubators and even in understanding what an incubator is. So the organization then um, got into a partnership with the University of Pretoria and introduced the incubation governance and management development program, which is open to um, incubation managers and center uh, managers. It started as a pilot and then with, with a lot of success and is now one of the programs that are offered uh, by UP. That leads me to my question of whether is there a need for professionalization in the ESD space now. Uh, Billy spoke earlier on, uh, I think about master classes and e-learning platforms. Should, should we keep support and capacity building of ESD practitioners at that level? Or is there value in um, professionalizing ESD space? And I think it's something that uh, Lita also touched on um, Ilya, uh, when we started the session. Mm. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, when you start something new, you know, you start probably everywhere and, and, and you travel the journey and then you consolidate. And then I think we are at the stage of consolidation to some extent. And, and consolidation includes taking stock of the journey lessons learned and what worked, what didn't work, why right? certain things didn't work, we refine, we move forward. So in that sense, I mean, that necessitate formalizing certain frameworks and, and, and we must not be caught into formalizing, now becoming the be it all. We must talk about frameworks because frameworks gives you the guide. They are guidelines. But, we're, but we, 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 we live in a world where things are evolving all the time. So, so formalizing will help us to provide frameworks first and foremost, to some extent when you have, for instance, if we go in a qualification route, you know, if you get a qualification in 2023, you know, 2030, you are able to say, I have seven, I have had the qualification for seven years and, and there's over and above that, what have I learned? You know, I wish I was presenting, there's a, a what you call a sketch that I find it very motivational, which gives you, you know, you learn this much from, from the books, this much from the books and experience and that much from mistakes, right? So, so we must allow ourselves to, that to play in that space of making mistakes, but being accountable. Because that will now necessitate us coming around 
platforms like this where we are all practitioners of the same objective and, and we are able to to share the learnings because because you know you learn by or from mistakes <laughs> you know so the platform which is the formalization so so i'm hoping that we we will go through the coaching mentoring uh engaging format rather than textbook based because why are we call practitioners why are we why are we going to through the textbook mode so we should be that makes sense because it allows us to really share the experiences and, and, and it allows us to also shape up the framework for the new entrant. So, because if it's a new entrant, then this is the framework. You don't have to go through the mistakes that I've gone through, at least from a framework point of view, to, to, to get a leap into, into the industry. Thank you. Your take on professionalization is there a case for professionalization. Um, yeah, I think um, there's a ex a colleague of mine here, I won't mention his name. We had a heated argument about <clears throat> this thing of whether someone who's as a professional but has never run a business can provide business advice, you know. So versus someone, he's probably laughing at the back, right? versus someone who's not, like doesn't have a formal qualification but has run a few business, which of these is the best place to advise on the business. I think there's a room for both. If you want to grow your business and, and basically export, you need someone who understands export law and all of that stuff. And that's someone who's educated in that space. So I think there is a need to professionalize um, the practitioner space. So at least to get, uh, we agree on a set of common standards. What is, what constitutes a good business turnaround strategist? You know, There must be some theories embedded in the kind of work we're doing. But what becomes important is we need to be contextual in that a lot of the people that are doing this kind of work might not have the resources to professionalize themselves. So again, you can incentivize ESD programs to capacitate practitioners and probably get the recognizers grant funding, for example. So I think there is a, a, a huge role for professional. I, I mean, I am for that, but let's also understand that some people, let's not close people out, let's not use professionalization as a screening tool to say is, you know, you don't, you don't belong to a professional body, so you can't be contacted. Whereas that person probably is the best place person to intervene. So let's try and understand that and, and help people that don't have the resources to professionalize themselves. Let's create avenues for those to happen, yeah. But I'm a big advocate for it, yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a confusing question, I suppose, because if you look at um, ESD and you take the various aspects of the scorecard, so, you know, it's a procurement, it's developing businesses who can become suppliers, mm. and then seeing that transition from ED uh, to SD and then the procurement happening. So if you look at the demand and supply side, I suppose, of that equation, you know, the demand side is on the procurement side to a certain extent, um, and, and there's a qualification around that. You know, if it's um, supply chain and procurement, it's uh, I'm invariably SIPs or something along those lines. So that's a specialization. People are specialized there. If you look at the development side or the supply side, I suppose, it's made up of development programs, as it were. And those development programs are made up of learning mentoring and coaching invariably. So to be a coach, one should ideally have a coaching qualification. Mm -hmm. To be a mentor, there are various mentor uh, courses out there. Your learning, I guess you can choose to have that accredited or not, which would then meet the um, compliance requirements. But being an ESD practitioner would then be able to marry all of those together, you know, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. So what would the outcome of that qualification be to a certain extent? Because on the development side, it's um, um, producing quality entrepreneurs and businesses, I suppose, who, have, um, who can scale and grow. On the procurement side, it's being able to successfully diversify your supply chain and um, provide the opportunities to emerging businesses within that. So would the ESD practitioner then effectively encompass all of that? Um, so I'm just, you know, I think I still need to understand the detail more before I can answer the question. Yeah, I, I think if, if we go back to 
some of the points that we discussed this morning um, in, in, in the ESG space, for instance, the supply chain practitioner, there's a training that they go through, there's, there's a qualification uh, for that. But once you become an ESG practitioner, you may not even be coming from a supply chain um, environment, which somehow gives you a foundation or the basis of what you are trying to do in bringing new suppliers into your, your supply chain. And quite often there's no, there's no point of reference because it's such a diverse environment. Some people come purely from a, a transformation background and you have to facilitate access to ESD opportunity um, to a corporate. So the thinking is coming from that perspective that with people that are coming from all these different background, uh, backgrounds and find themselves as ESD practitioners, is there value in bringing in professionalization in this space, some sort of standardization, some introduction into um, ESG tools, for example? Mm. So that's, that's where the thinking is coming from. Mm. Yeah, I just think it would uh, need to be unpacked, you know, quite significantly mm. to be able to put that sort of qualification together, mm. if that's the route to go. I definitely think there's merit in it, mm. um, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to, uh, needs to happen around that as well. Mm. Okay. Matib. Um, so I think that uh, we probably need to identify key skills Mm. that are critical for the practice mm. so um so in that sense it is professionalization mm. but also we need to create career paths and career growth outside of esd because remember esd is a is mainly south african so if i say i'm an esd executive someone might think i am in software development or whatever the case is so i think um it, we just need to consider the diverse, uh, and, and I'll give an example with the with the CA qualification. Um, it's a, it's broad enough for you to kind of do a whole multitude of things, and it, you're able to gain global recognition as well. So I think if we can do that in this mm -hmm. space, I think it will not only it will make it an attractive field to get people into the into the space, mm -hmm. talented people into the space, because at this point it, it looks more like codes and you know the boring stuff right mm. but we need to make it exciting we need to make it fresh we need to make it um, applicable across um, you know international it must be internationally recognized one thing that um, you know developed countries do very well especially in, in America is they develop their own frameworks so he spoke about frameworks they develop their own frameworks they also um, document so we basically need to document certain things as well, because the one thing we're not documenting, I mean, I, I've i documented a strategy, but I haven't documented if he came in, he probably wouldn't be able to um, understand the broader ESD practice, right? And so I think documenting is very important amongst um, ESD practitioners, and we are able to share that with each other as well. I think that's a low, that's low hanging fruit. Um, but skills like communication, data analytics, whatever the case is, um, the point is that those then allow people to be more diverse than just ESD qualified people. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask um, kind of a controversial question because when I, I was listening to, I was listening to Busi, I was listening to uh, Maud earlier, and what was going on in my mind is that if you are an, an ESG practitioner, even, even Karen who was just here, you're actually standing in between the, the small supplier or the entrepreneur and buyers um, in, your, in your company. And you always have to do this balancing act um, on one hand and ensuring that you are delivering on the company strategy. And you're also mindful of the fact that the company is here to make profit 
On the other hand, you are a transformation and a change um, agent, and this has to go all out to bring the small uh, suppliers into um, your supply uh, chain. To what extent is this contributing to the limited performance of ESD in, in your uh, companies? And, and perhaps my second question, you can choose which one to address. Um, there are companies who have their own, you know, internal ESG practitioners and it's driven internally. In certain instances, it's completely outsourced. In your view, which, which works better and why? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll give it a step at the first question. You know, I, I, and I think, I mean, I started off by saying, you know, it's perspective and intention. And then I think that's, that's the crux of, of, of the conversation because as a practitioner, you know, you, we all get a, a employed and, you know, I'm glad you decided to be controversial because BEE is controversial, transformation is controversial, supply development is controversial. You know, you decide where you pack from very con controversial to not controversial from an entity point of view. But the subject that we are discussing today is by nature controversial because to some extent it's doing business in reverse. You know, it's, 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 if you are not going to paint the right perspective, you know, have those difficult conversation with your C-suite, you know, with your global office, if you are multinational and, and you are going to tow the line, the compliance route, still perspective, <laughs> you know, it's a nuisance, let's tick the box, let's move on. So we need to have conversation that provides the right perspective. And as practitioners, I think we need to hold ourselves accountable because among ourselves, we have different, very diverse groups, you know, you, you sustain your pocket and there's people who say like, I will walk out of this company because of one, two, three. <laughs> You know, because I'm a practitioner for change and a very difficult change. So, so, so that's where it stems. I mean, it's, it's around the relationships. For instance, we need, like I said, we, are, we need to consolidate. You know, we started with a framework that was speaking about others without them. <laughs> because these businesses, they're small, who are they? Where are they? You know, and how are we deciding their future <laughs> without them? So we need to come together and have conversation with the businesses and hear their real pinpoint. And, and, and if you are a change agent in an organization, maybe run a workshop with a supplier, with a CEO, let, him, let them get it straight, straight out. You know, what are the real problems so that when you go and have a secondary conversation around the next step, then they have the same context. You are not used as a buffer, you know, to keep the profits and pacify the nuisance in the system. <laughs> So, so that we have that. So we should be having frank conversation. We need to accept that there's a moral problem, which is controversial in its own, but has serious business objectives. Because if we understand the ecosystem properly, inclusion promotes activity, which stabilizes the economy. It's that simple, but, but we struggle because we go through shortcuts, you know, Compliance, compliance, compliance. Those who go into the, you know, at least the deeper end, then there's no relationship with the supplier. For instance, you know, as I, if I use an example for, for my, my world, you know, I'm in the short term insurance space as, a, as an association level, and I deal with panel beaters and motor body repairers, the, the towers the, what you call it, Giza repairers. And, and those people are, are not so sophisticated in their language, <laughs> you know? So you need to understand that, that you're going to speak to someone who is critical in your value proposition to your consumer. Because if my car is not fixed right, <laughs> my insurer has failed me, but my insurer is not gonna fix the car. You know, it's someone else who may not be speaking as eloquently. <laughs> But, but I need to understand that. And, and I need to engage with them at a certain level. I need to hold them accountable in terms of the language and teach them, uh, uh, you know? So we have to have a, an agent, that's our job. You need to have a relationship with your, your employer if you're employed by an entity, but you have to have a relationship with the beneficiaries. And I hate the term, but it is the term that exists. So that then you create, you know, when you have problems, speak up 
And problem could be, I'm not getting through this or I'm struggling with this because we teach beneficiaries to hide the problems and then we penalize them for them. Whereas actually we must use those problems as part of the, what do you call it? The repository for lessons learned and what can be done differently. Thank you very much. Um, I think on the relationship between ESD and, and supply chain, I think it depends um, on, this, on the sector. I think I was unfortunate in that we are embedded in the communities. Mining, you mine in a community. You know? And these are the people that expect opportunities from the mine. And they're quite militant at times if they don't get opportunities. So it's easy for you to say to supply chain, how can I solve your transformation problems? So they will say, we want to do conveyor belt maintenance, for example. In three years time, we believe we can localize this, give it a local black owned business, but no one has the skills, you know. So you can then as EST say, okay, give me the quality and standards one needs to qualify this. I'll train three guys. They can decide to JV and bid for this or they can compete or whatever. Cause you, you agree you're gonna ring fence this opportunity in three years time for black, whether it's black women owned businesses from the local community. So you, I think our context makes it easy for me to say to supply chain, what, what are you battling with? And they're saying, look, there's certain areas where I'm not, I'm not battling like, like cleaning, security and all of that, but the core mining activity, I'm not getting qualified people to compete for these opportunities that meet particular demographics. I can then say, give me three years, give me the quality and standards, commit to ring fences opportunity, and then in three years I'll develop guys that to be ready for that opportunity. So I think when you start asking supply chain, what problems do you have that I can solve? Then you become a value add to them and not just being someone that is um, trying to break old relationships they have with previous suppliers. So I think that's that's what has 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 worked in our in our instances. Asking them, what problems do you face, and how can I be the solution to those problems? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it has to be intentional and it has to be strategic. I think that's the key. If it's not driven from the top, it's very unlikely that it's going to happen, or it's going to happen meaningfully. And I mean, funnily enough, very often procurement doesn't even have a seat at the table at the top to a certain extent. And it's hard enough getting procurement to buy into um, supplier diversity and um, turning things on the head, I think, as you know, sort of I'm going against normal business practice. So I think that's key if, you know, if it starts at the top and then um, people also, you know, speak about it needs to be seen in people's KPIs. You know, people need to be measured on it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that also helps um, 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 to a large extent, but it's, it's very often that business doesn't have that business development side of the equation once again. So they can lay the fertile ground for the opportunities, which is key, um, making those opportunities available, you know, is key as well, but the development of the existing suppliers to be able to get access to those opportunities and grow on those back of those opportunities, as well as building the pipeline of new suppliers for the future opportunities, doesn't necessarily, or the, um, um, the corporate's not necessarily best positioned to do that work. So I think there needs to be that collaboration in a way between the corporate internally and the service providers to be able to provide that end-to-end -end solution. Because the more fertile the ground is within the corporate, the more benefits and impact is seen because it's ready for development effectively. Yeah, I think the reality is that um, you've captured it. Corporates exist to make profits. Um, and actually, and that's why initially I was saying, what is the what we're talking about? Ultimately, ESD, as much as it is, actually commercial in nature in terms of how you need to carry it out. It is an equity tool. So in most instances, you are looking at transforming a supply chain, you know, so it's not enough just to, um, you know, give money away and so on. And to transform a, a, a supply chain is, it means that at some point you have to make trade-offs. Mm -hmm. You know, you either are getting a small guy, he's not as doesn't have quality or he doesn't have economies of scale and so on. And that can be contentious. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that is the reality of the issue. I think we can't run away from it. Uh, we do not have a Huawei, for example, in South Africa. We don't have another small business that is a Huawei that has the equipment. And so the fight I will have is, can we replace the Huawei? Can we replace uh, Microsoft and so on? But the truth of the matter is, we then need to think about what is the commercial value behind that. And that's where I think, quite correct, the strategic positioning is important, but it must not be done uh, without aligning in values. Because ultimately the value from the top must be that this is transformation. At the end of the day, there's an equity component to it. We are trying to uh, ultimately the measure, one of the measures that we need to think about is how much of wealth sits in black people's hands. That is what we're trying to do. Um, and so, uh, and we then need to figure out how do we optimize then for getting black people to have wealth, you know, through ESD. And that should then be the outcome. The outcome cannot just be that um, I've gotten the points. You, you get what I'm saying? And therefore the, the corporate chases the scorecard because it's very good for them to, to, to talk about in the media, but it's also good for them for, for tenders. So we need to align in values. This is a tool to, um, to redress the past and we all need to buy into that. And we all need to internalize it. And I think that the key thing with ESD programs, as much as some of them have been successful, and we sit at board meetings and we can say that guy started off as like a young, you know, SMME that we invested in. Now they are generating. So the key thing is we need to go back and say it's not just about that guy. Collectively, have we been able to shift that Gini coefficient? Because that Gini coefficient has color. It has a past. So we need to align on values. And I think that uh, once we get that right, we will get the rest of the ecosystem right. Okay. I think the last one that I would like to uh, get from each one of you, your, your parting shot, uh, the establishment of the COP, as Gary has said, was preceded by you know, a lot of strategic dialogues um, with both private and and public sector. And the, the interesting thing is that even National Treasury has approached us and have asked for training for SCM practitioners across government on ESD, um, which is a very good thing. And I think this is also backed by the statistics that we saw earlier from the GAGE report on how uh, SOEs and public sector has performed on, on, on ESD in, in particular. And um, I'm quite aware that some of the people in the room were part of the focus groups and the, the dialogues that we, that we held. But for, for the sake of the people that haven't participated and haven't been part of those conversations, if the community of practice is to do one or two things very well from a practitioner point of view, what would that be? Okay, I think, yeah, for me, that would be, we need to change the narrative, right? So we start off, probably scrap the concept of development. Con concept of development has the connotation of substandard to begin with. So we must promote inclusion. So, so that's, so, so the narrative must speak to inclusion because that's where we should be going. If we speak that, then it incorporates development because when you include and you pick up the gaps, you close the gaps. Whereas we try and close the gaps and the gaps never close. That's why we never, we, we are on a hamster, you know, trade. Uh, we know the problems. I think we all, that's why we're sitting here. It's, it's that action singing from the same hymn. Let's change the narrative. And, and it speaks to these definitions that we use because we offend the beneficiaries when we saying we need to put one, two, three for you before we can do A, B, C, whereas actually this is what we want. What are you struggling with to get there? Because the, the narrative is really important for us. And like I said, it's perspective once again. And then once we frame our perspective again, we go to our intention. What are we going to do to resolve, you know, our attitude around something? Thank you. 
So we change narrative, 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 and then we'll speak access, access, access. I think Gary spoke about access to skills, access to finance and access to market. That's inclusion, thank you. Two things. Um, so I think one, maybe take a step back. I think we, what the community of practice can do is help us drive towards like an SME development theory of change for the country that we can all agree on, like the cause effect that you started ideation. How do you go from someone's got a business idea, the cause effects that are gonna lead you to become an industrialist, for example, that's supported by the DTIC. And what support is needed along this chain? And we can then agree, this is probably best for the private sector, for the public sector, for that, for that, for that. But I think we just need to have this common approach of SME development in the country and we know who's best place to play what role um, in that space. So I think that would be, um, if I was to be there, that would be task number one. Let's agree on this theory of change, these cause effects of someone sitting in a street corner that wants to become a huge enterprise. How do we walk them through that and who supports them along that journey? The second one I think is closer collaboration with academic institutions. There's a lot of research that's being done out there that's very current, that debunks some of the stuff that you're doing, but we don't really interact with, with research. And as a result, we probably providing the wrong solutions. I mean, I'll ask an example now, who of you have ever heard of a lady called Dr. Mama Bolo from Gibbs? Okay, see, there's very few people. So she did a PhD on the capacity needs of small businesses, like looking at small businesses across the business life cycle. And what she found that people at early stage, what they need most is like character building, self-esteem, confidence. They don't need business planning and marketing. They need self-belief. No one has interacted with that study. As a result, we take people with business ideas and we train them how to do a business plan, a marketing plan, how to pitch when all these guys really need is a coach to coach them and to believe themselves, to be assertive, you know, to really believe in the idea. So I think interacting with academia can help us refine some of the programs we have because we probably borrow programs from the West, which is a different context to what we have here. So I also think hopefully the COP over time brings in academic institutions and they, we invite PhD students and MBA students to come and present their research and see how we can use that to refine practice as a COP, thanks. Uh, sure, only two. <laughs> um, well, I think the first one must be opportunities. You know, how do we see more opportunities being made available? And the knowledge shared, I suppose, as to how um, to de-risk those opportunities, because that's obviously the big concern is what risk is going to be you know, posed to my supply chain if I suddenly bring in these new suppliers, smaller suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, it's, um, how do we de-risk uh, the opportunities within the supply chain? And then um, secondly would be the change management that goes along with the processes um, as well. Um, so, I suppose they can have the best attentions at the strategic level, but it still needs to be implemented, you know, throughout the organization. So sharing knowledge, success stories, best practice, et cetera, et cetera, um, could be part of the change management process that corporates can use to bring this concept into the company and to be able to share it and the benefits and the impact that it's, you know, that it can create and to move it away from that thinking around the scorecard compliance. Because also, yeah, I mean, the verification agents, I know they have a job to do, but they also um, propagate, if I can put it that way, in terms of, because it's just a nightmare if you're a generic having a full, you know, BE audit. Um, and that wasn't the intention of the codes. And, you know, we need to move away from that. People need to be inspired again, I think you know, as to what we're trying to do. They need to see what can be achieved. And I mean, something that was going through my mind as well is that we can actually teach the rest of the world how to do this to a large extent because everybody's battling with the same thing. 
well, not battling with the same thing that's negative. Everybody's trying to achieve, you know, the benefits and the impact that this can do. Um, and I mean, we've been practicing it for years. Yes, it's not the best outcome that we would like to have seen, but there's so many lessons that have been learned and ways not to do things and the right way to do things. And I mean, even America, you know, um, still has a long way to go in terms of um, supplier diversity. And they do have the intention to move down that road. Um, and there is a lot that we can share and learn through what we've been through. So I think we mustn't forget that as well. Yeah, so I think, I think we should um, align on values. What are we wanting to do? So I think that has been said many times. I think then we need to align on the key metrics that will inform us that we have achieved, we, we are going to be achieving that change. And then we need to relook at our policy to see whether ESD, the way it's configured now, makes sense from a policy perspective. Um, because a lot of it, in my view, doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> it's really, uh, it's mixing a lot of different things. Um, so I think we need to really sit down and say, what are the key things we want to achieve? Let's focus on, you know, the values and what then underlies that matrix. What would be the metrics that tell us we've, we've reached, you know, we've reached the promised land. And then how do we simplify our policy to be able to get everybody to, to rally behind that? Because I really don't think, I don't think that corporates are against um, Triple B. I just think that it can be quite complicated. And then, you know, whereas, you know, at the back of your mind, this is the right thing to do, but it's just too complex. So I think let's do those three things. Thank you very much. And, and I think, Lustapo, you've just hit the nail on the head on the theory of change, because it's one of the things that the department is uh, currently working on together with the ADSE program um, to develop a theory of change for all the department program. And I think MZ is in charge of the ESD one. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I think some of the information that is, is coming out of here. So Gary and the rest of the colleagues, if the, the agenda and the mandate of the COP wasn't clear enough, I think we've gotten more input uh, from here as practitioners. And from my side, coming from a, a government entity, also the, the role of private practitioners versus that of entities like CEDA uh, is also very important in ensuring that we are not crowding each other out of the space, but rather we complement uh, what all of us can, you know, can bring into ESD for the benefit of, uh, of um, entrepreneurs. And um, uh, what I'm getting from the panel is, is confirmation, you know, for the need of the COP, like Karen said, Transformation can be very lonely, can be a very uncomfortable um, space. Uh, it takes a lot of passion. Uh, there used to be a term in CEDA that was saying small business is not for CCs. I'm sure Tavern will agree with me if he's still in the room. And, and one of my CEOs, I don't know if Sonela is still here, she used to say small business development is a thankless job. It is indeed a thankless job and you can't do it if you don't have passion, if, if you don't um, like it. But in, in conclusion, uh, if COP is to be, you know, uh, beneficial from a, a practitioner's perspective, we need to, it has to have a focus on inclusion. We need to develop a theory of uh, change, which will then, you know, identify the various things that we need to, to do and identify the role of public uh, versus private sector collaboration with the tertiary institution. Uh, we don't have to do everything from scratch. There's a lot of uh, research that uh, has been done um, already. Uh, knowledge sharing, a focus on de-risking. But as Mark says, we can 
talk about everything and anything else if it's not about bringing more opportunities to the entrepreneurs, growing entrepreneurs, increasing their contribution to GDP, then it's not worth any effort. So at this stage, I would like to uh, thank my wonderful panelists. Um, I heard there were gifts earlier from the other for the other panel. Okay. <laughs> okay. Before we stand up, can we take two, three questions okay. for the people that do have questions for our panel this afternoon? I'll just start here uh, and then we will take two more. We are wary of time. You are in Santon. If you leave after four, you might as well stay for a drink and leave after six. For the people that don't live in Joburg, you know the traffic here. So we're going to make sure that we do leave here in time to miss the Santon traffic. So let's take three questions and then we will wrap it up for the day. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ngwasanati. The same name is Tolom. I uh, come from a company called uh, Senmanzi. Um, from what I have listened to today, I see similarities between the development of human resources and um, ESD. Um, and uh, I see red flags because of that. I used to be an HR, um, I used to be an HR practitioner in the early 90s. And I left HR because we were the other guys. There was the business and there were us as HR. And the HR people did HR things and the business did business. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm scared I've not had anyone talking about how we will move the, um, <clears throat> the ESD imperative into the mainstream of business, meaning business exists for growth and they, this growth is done through two things. Either you provide a service or you provide a product yeah. which you sell to the those are the, that's, that's it. So that's where the business is. And they do this through a value chain. And I've not had anyone talking about how are we going to move ESD into the value chain so that it becomes the business of business. Mm. It doesn't become and the issue of the other guys in the corner there. So that when the business has got a problem, we start retrenching them first because they're not adding value to the business. Um, I left, coming back to that, I left HR because of that. And I joined, um, I became a, a, a business development. So I joined business development, I was doing HR, I was doing um, uh, sales and marketing. And of course, business development. And I think, I've got these red flags that I have, and I've not heard anyone talking about that. And I think it is extremely important if this is going to survive as a sector. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think we'll let Lusapo, you are the one in corporate, you'll bite that one. Let's take a question here in the front from Busi. Um, I think mine is mainly a comment just to support what you're saying. So ESD obviously should not be a one blanket approach. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in my organization, so ESD is part of the value chain. So ESD sits within procurement, which is part of finance, because we've had it before where it was sitting in a different department for PECs, but there was non uh, compliance and we were given all the reasons why it cannot happen. Yeah. So, which is why even the practitioners within my team that basically run, they're responsible for the sourcing. So they are the buyers themselves. So there's nobody standing. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for budget setting. And a lot of them come from business operations. So if we've got somebody that is going to source for logistics, you find that there is somebody that has worked within the logistics that understands it. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about maintenance repair operations, I've got engineers in my team that do the sourcing, that drive the supplier development, which I think I agree with the terminology that 
for us, it's not about development, it's about inclusion mm -hmm. and moving from there to say, we are including you into a supply chain. We work with you, we identify the gaps, we close the gaps to make sure that you're sustainable and you grow. Thanks, Brucey, for that comment. Is there a last question? There's one there, Masipo. Let's take the third one and then we can ask our facilitator and our panelists to just close in on, on those questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to the panel. I quite enjoyed, uh, you know, listening to all your, your commentary around ESD. And I, I, you know, I picked up a few key words, values, intent, objectives. And I think this is the where we need to go back to, the back to the basics, yeah? Because ESD is, is a particular element within the scorecard that is meant to encourage a competitive and thriving small business sector. ESD is implemented across all sectors, across the generic scorecard, et cetera. And I think there was mention of a 26 billion rand pot. Yeah. Uh, that sits within the control of, of, of uh, corporate South Africa. Yeah. So 20 years, and I mean, I, I feel like I've been having this conversation quite a bit um, in, in recent weeks, 20 years after the promulgation of the BE Act, as practitioners within this room, can we hand on heart, say we've contributed to this thriving SME sector? Have we contributed to creating sustainable you know, small businesses, or have we led a very self-serving agenda, you know, of, uh, you know, um, of when we look at job creation, you know, I know what that typically means. And I think some, some of this has been shared where you, yeah. you give an entity enough of a contract for them to create a job mm -hmm. so that you can claim it back into your scorecard. And then next year, same with graduation, mm -hmm. you look for another beneficiary. Mm -hmm. And so you have this cycle of um, SMEs which are considered in a way, or, or SMEs rather, which are look, considered as what they, they come with their begging bowl, right? Mm -hmm. Year on year. This is the perception we have of the SME sector. So I think, Temba, to what you mentioned when we started around perspective, it's really just changing the economic relations that exist between the big corporates and these small entities, yeah. where we know big corporates have the, the funding, et cetera, but we're very slow to respond generally, right? So we're sluggish, we're bureaucratic, uh, we're slow to respond to market shifts, we're slow to respond to technological shifts, et cetera. SMMEs bring, you know, the sort of value and dynamism, which is typically not unpacked. Yeah, the innovation, yeah. the, um, you know, small businesses can be at the cutting edge of technology, that entrepreneurial spirit, where they, if that relationship between corporates and small businesses is defined or reimagined differently, it's more collaboration versus you are the beneficiary yeah. and I am the giver, right? Yeah. So it's, it's really more a plea um, and a comment from myself working in this space that we need to yeah, just reconsider how we look at ESG or rather ESD in, in the next phase. You know, 20 years later, we're now moving. There, there are many more pressures mm -hmm. to get this thing right, given the amounts of investment that are put into the into ESG the space. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's really that SMEs are not there for handouts, but rather should be considered a partner in solutioning for a lot of the problems that we face yeah. in a country like ours. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we wanna go into that first question? Okay. Everyone's running away from this question. <laughs> I think it's a, it's, a valid, it's a valid point. I mean, I'll share my experiences I've been in this company for like nearly five years now, right? So, um, and fortunately it's a black owned, black managed listed company. So transformation was like important for the company when I came in. 
So obviously the first thing is you have to build a bit of credibility that your programs make sense, you know? And I think once we had that credibility and I think winning a couple of awards like the APSA Business Day Awards gave us that credibility. Once we had done that, the next question was to go to business and say, how can you be the solution to some of your problems, you know? So at tier one or corporate level risks, we ask what are the top risks and how can we be a solution to some of those risks? So as a mining company, your mining license to operate is, if that's canceled, you don't mind, business goes under. So how can we as ESD be one of the solutions to sort of mitigating that social license to operate? Another one is community unrest. If the guys close a mine, you can't move trucks of coal out, it's lost revenue. What are the challenges? Why are these guys closing the mine down? It's because of opportunities. Why are they not getting opportunities? Because they're not ready. So let me prepare them. So when opportunities come, they're ready, they get opportunities, they employ local people and that. So we then push ourselves at a tier one to say, we can be a solution to some of these risks, you know? And if you are to remove us, this would be the effect on how this risk is managed. So you present yourself as a solution. We then move to tier two, where the mind says, okay, I'm willing to give this guy this opportunity. I've never worked with him. It's the first time he's managing a contract of like 50 million rands a year, for example. How do you make sure it doesn't fail? Because if this guy fails, to replace him is going to take me six months, which means there's inactivity for six months, there's lost revenue, you don't get your bonus, share price drops, all of that stuff. So again, there you go in and say, I will get a retired guy who understands the business to handhold this guy for the first six months until he's able to hit his production targets and it gradually released. So I think you need to present yourself as ESD as a solution to some of the things that keep business awake at night. Once you do that, then I think you will really get, they'll start seeing you as, as a value add to the business and not as a grudge spend or a compliance spend. But it's on the back of you proving credibility in the first place, seeing some guys come in as, as junior, as like as, as basically a subcontractor to now basically being a contractor at three or four of our mines and doing very well. You can demonstrate the success that you can build sustainable business. And I think that's been our story in five years where we've been able to, I think, do quite a bit of work in, 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 that, in that regard. Thanks. Just to add like a few sentences, I think yeah, on what Ungo Snati asked, you know, HR and, 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 and this conversation and he said red flags. I mean, that's why we speak about diversity, equity and inclusion now, which is the, that's the progress where we should be going to and speak about internal DEI, which is about the people, because really you cannot change the external, which would be the cons consumer and the supplier without changing the people that you work with. Or, yeah. So corporate culture or, or internal inclusion or transformation is as key, if not more key in us achieving anything that is external because you can't have agents who are cannot, who do not identify with the problem. So, so I think, I mean, today we focus on the ESD, but really in essence, transformation, it, it encompasses all the, the elements. And, and I think, I mean, as South Africans, and it's those moments where I think you spoke about, we don't document. Mm -hmm. Globally, we're speaking about DE, DEI, we've been doing it. <laughs> and I can tell you, even today, most of us here have not connected the dots. So it's going to be a phenomenon that we are going to pretend like we are starting from scratch, actually, whereas we probably have been the pioneers. The world should be learning from us, but because we don't pay that much attention in terms of what we do. And once again, our intentions and our perception of what we do is never really aligned. That's why we look like we follow us even when we are leading. Thank you. Let's ask our facilitator. I'm just wary of time. Are you desperate? 30 seconds. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm. Um, I mean, I've been past and led programs that are very successful that I think from an exco board perspective have gotten the right uh, amount of, of attention. But I think what is important in the communities of practice is that we need to have honest conversations. And a lot of times um, we need to be clear in terms of what are we trying to do? What does success look like? And um, yeah, I mean, you speak about ESG, for example, the, you know, and, and CSI. You know, one of the main reasons, and my hypothesis is that one of the main reasons why uh, that scorecard we saw this morning has full points everywhere on SCD 
is because um, SCD has been advocated as CSI across the world. And people understand CSI, I have to give, I have to give to my community and nobody's expecting real magical business ROI from it. They understand it as their duty to give and make their community grow. I think we need to get to a point where the same can be said about ESD. Firstly, there's a duty component to it. And if we do, if corporates run away from that, if we cannot sit in the boardroom and have a conversation about how many black businesses do you have in here and, and understand why that matters. I don't think then we should be embarking on the journey. Yes, absolutely. We can have commercial, um, uh, we, can, we can definitely commercialize ESD. I mean, we've done innovation programs, we've done hackathons and so on, but at the center and at the core of it, we should be coming back home and say, what is it? Why does this matter? Why is this so important? And I think that's where we need to align. Thank you very much. We'll just ask our facilitator to quickly close for us, and then we will let our guests go back to their seats. Yeah, just uh, I think a quick one from me, uh, just to reiterate what uh, Bussi said. Uh, one of the big retailers that uh, we're working with a lot in Cape Town on ESG, the reason why we've had successes with them is because ESG is part of their driver of their strategy. Um, they are merchandising, part of their merchandising uh, strategy. The, the new uh, suppliers uh, that are part of their ESG, their timelines and everything for delivery are informed by the, the businesses merchandising strategy. What are the new things that they want to, to bring in, on board? And that's the only way it can be part of the core uh, business. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give a round of applause to our panel. Uh, as you walk down, please don't forget to collect your gifts from Odette and the team. Yeah, you can stand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we wrap up, I have a very strict instruction. Have you completed your evaluation form? Please take two minutes to complete your evaluation form. It is here, it's not available online, so please complete it quickly for two minutes now before we wrap up so that you can give it to the team. They are going around the tables to collect. And please be honest, be honest about your expectations, be honest about the day, be honest about the conversations, also what you want to hear next. What wasn't covered that you expected to be covered today? So just be honest in rating the team about the day today. Tomorrow will have its own evaluation form. So don't go into tomorrow. This evaluation form is just for today. I see collection happening. Are we happy to close? Okay, I think, ladies and gents, let's quickly close and then we can network a little bit over tea. Um, if you are still networking and speaking with the people that you met today, even the people that you know, just quickly in closing, I think today's conversation was, it was necessary. And I think for today, we, we, we're taking away one word, collaboration. Um, and in taking collaboration, Lusapo, Dr. Lusapo, you are making, you're distracting us. I will call you out. Also because he's my colleague, so I can call him out. 
So the one word that we're taking away from today, I think is really collaboration. And there's a few key themes that really came out of today that we will further unpack tomorrow. And coming from the themes today was really practitioner development and qualification, professionalizing ESD, right? And when it comes to development as corporates, we are not competitors. We really do have one goal. And common SMME needs that came out, access to markets, funding, skills transfer. How do we as practitioners and government put together resources to make sure that SMMEs within the various stages of businesses get the right resources and requirements that are needed? And this is where Dr. Lusapo spoke about the SMME development theory of change, because SMMEs and entrepreneurs go through life phases. And we always have to make sure that the need is met where the SMME is at. If he's early stage, the need needs to be around that. If he is seed, the need needs to be around that. If he is in development, if he is in growth phase, the need needs to be around that. So the need needs to be tailored and the initiatives need to be tailored to the need of the SMME for greater impact. We also said, how do we spread markets and sectors for SMMEs? Honest conversations, I think we also need to have with entrepreneurs. There are markets that are highly saturated by our entrepreneurs. We need to start unbundling some of those things. And collaboration for a lot of us here, access to supply chains, coordinated initiatives. We have to do gap analysis on SMMEs. If you don't do a gap analysis, you're not gonna know what an SMME needs. Otherwise you give them a one size fits all approach. And that's when we don't get the impact that we're all looking for. And lastly, just resource sharing and things that the panels and some of our speakers spoke about, things that we need to stop doing. Tick boxing, initiatives without monitoring and evaluation. And I think this is where the conversation today stems from. Monitoring and evaluation, and one of our guests was speaking about, there's so much funds that have been spent in ESD. What do we have to show for it? Where are these successful businesses that have benefited? So we really have to do proper monitoring and evaluation so that we can measure the impact that has really come out of ESD programs. But with that said, tomorrow is another jam-packed day. We get to hear from the BE commissioner himself. We get to hear from the minister of small business and her team. So we have another jam-packed morning where the afternoon we get to hear some cases from entrepreneurs. I think it's very interesting to hear from practitioners and government side, but tomorrow in the afternoon, we're going to take it a step further and hear from entrepreneurs how they've benefited and what opportunities they've had from the corporates that have spoken today so that we can hold them honest also. So please don't be late. We will start again at nine o'clock sharp and we will have another scrumptious lunch. Gary did say, I must say that, because people will say, this is why I, I look like how I look because of the food I eat. But we will have another scrumptious lunch tomorrow. So please be here on time, nine o'clock. We will be starting with the BE commissioner. So you don't want to miss that opening around ESD and where the commissioner sees ESD going in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, Please drive safe out of Santon. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Uh, if you haven't handed in your evaluation forms, please give it to Odette and her team and have yourselves a good evening. <laughs>